Preface Tissue is torn, blood vessels are severed, blood is spilled, and much fluid is lost. The heart races and the blood pressure soars. There's moaning, crying, and screaming. A severe injury? No, only a relatively normal human birth. The description sounds pathological because the symptoms were not discussed in relation to the outcome. A new human being. In a darkened room, a man sits alone. His body is swept by muscle spasms. Indescribable sensation and sharp pains run from his feet up his legs and over his back and neck. His skull feel as if it's about to burst. Inside his head, he hears roaring sounds and high-pitched whistling. His hands burn. He feels his body tearing within. Then suddenly, he laughs and is overcome with bliss. A psychotic episode? No, this is a psychophysiological transformation, a rebirth process as natural as physical birth. It seems pathological only because the symptoms are not understood in relation to the outcome, a psychically transformed human being. When allowed to progress to completion, this process may culminate in deep psychological balance, inner strength, and emotional maturity. Its initial stages, however, often share the violence, helplessness, and imbalance that attend the start of extrauterine human life. For thousands of years, this transformative process has been hinted at, often only in veiled terms. Earliest references to it can be found in the most ancient scriptures of India, the Vedas. This archaic knowledge formed the basis for the later esoteric teachings as expounded in the Upanishads, Agamas, Tantras, and Samhitas, and especially the many texts belonging to the Hatha Yoga tradition. But knowledge of this rebirth process was by no means confined to India. It was an integral part of the esoteric teachings of Tibetan Buddhism, Chinese Taoism, the spiritually of certain American Indian tribes, and, as we shall see, even of the Bushmen of Africa. According to E.A.S. Butterworth, 1970, there is evidence that knowledge of this transmutative process actually existed in the ancient Sumerian civilization. But we need not necessarily assume that it was diffused from there. As Jean Gebser, 1985, Eric Newman, 1970, and Ken Wilbur, 1981, and others have suggested, early humanity was rather strongly predisposed to psychic experiences, as indeed many non-Western people. It was, however, in Hindu India that the process was most carefully studied and conceptually elaborated. There it became known as Kundalini Bodhana, or the awakening of the Kundalini. The Sanskrit word Kundalini means literally she who is coiled, which is a picturesque metaphor for the serpent. I shall explain later the ramifications of meaning surrounding this esoteric concept and phenomenon. Suffice it to say here that the Kundalini, or as it is also frequently referred to, Kundalini Shakti or serpent power, is conceived as a form of psycho-spiritual energy. It is the energy of consciousness. What this means will be made clear in this book, inasmuch it can be communicated in words. Those who are adept at the Kundalini process characteristically emphasize that the Kundalini can only be truly understood through first-hand experience. The process of psychophysiological transformation was, until recently, apparently confined to distant cultures, esoteric traditions, and a handful of isolated individuals. Accounts of it have, as a rule, been highly personal terms often permeated with vague mysticism and strange mythology. As a result, the descriptions were not taken seriously by Western students of the human psyche. This, in turn, delayed the systematic comparison of available materials from different traditions, which would have shown that the Kundalini process is an important phenomenon that deserves most careful attention from scientists. Thus, for a long time, those few professionals who encountered this phenomenon could feel justified in taking a skeptical and suspicious stance towards it. 
in the 1970s, two significant developments occurred that changed the situation sufficiently to challenge the prevalent professional mindset. The first development was the marked increase in the number of people undergoing intense psycho-spiritual experiences within our own culture. And the second was, after a decades-long taboo on consciousness, Western scientists began to consider consciousness a viable subject for research again. This led to studies on the objective aspects of those processes that had hitherto been addressed only in esoteric or symbolic terms and that had consequently eluded the inquiries of Western science. Today it's possible to compare the psycho-spiritual experiences of different traditions by applying a uniform set of standards as well as to employ the same standards in a clinical context. There is indeed a remarkable uniformity in the descriptions of the transformative process from widely disparate traditions. This is also the point of view of Gopi Krishna, 1971, whose writings have been instrumental in popularizing the Kundalini process in the West. He argued that the recorded experiences of Christian mystics, Sufi masters and yoga adepts make it obvious that the fundamental features of the psychophysiological transformation are the same. A study of the various traditional accounts for which enough detail is recorded reveals symptom patterns and experiential phenomena that are strikingly similar to those found in the clinical cases cited in this book. I will argue that these common aspects have physiological components and that the activation of a single physiological mechanism is at the root of the wide diversity of Kundalini phenomena we encounter. If these two assumptions are correct, the idea of psychophysiological transmutation can no longer be considered a confusing jumble of primitive superstition, religious dogma, and wild rumor. Rather, we must begin to look again and more seriously at much of what scientism has tried to debunk as meaningless and worthless fantasy. In fact, we must embark on a new type of demythologizing, namely the demythologizing of the myth of scientific materialism. Granting, as I feel we must, that the Kundalini phenomenon is real and of great significance, we can now pose several questions. How is this phenomenon best understood? What are its basic features? How does it unfold? What is its optimal form? Does it really lead, as is widely claimed, to the appearance of psychic powers? How does the transformative process differ from normality on the one hand and from psychosis on the other? Is it merely another altered state of consciousness or is it something more? I begin by considering the last question first. The Kundalini process is clearly not just an altered state of consciousness, since it can last from several months to many years. For its duration, the individual passes in and out of different states of consciousness, from wakefulness to sleeping and dreaming, and also to super lucidity in any of these states. The entire process falls, in fact, outside the categories of normal and psychotic. Person undergoing this striking psychophysiological transformation has experiences that are far from normal, though usually without becoming so disorganized as to be considered psychotic. Neither is the Kundalini process necessarily connected with the appearance of psychic phenomena. There are psychics who have not undergone this transformation, just as there are those in whom the Kundalini is activated, but who show no particular psychic talent. That is to say, the Kundalini process may, and often does, lead to many special abilities, but it is not intrinsically tied to them. This is supported, for instance, by Swami Vishnu Trita, 1962. He pointed out that a yoga master who has control over his heart activity may still not have an awakened Kundalini, whereas this and similar abilities may well be absent in an adept of Kundalini yoga. Finally, what does this transformative process mean? How are we to understand its curious patterns and phenomena? Clearly, the person undergoing the transformative process is likely to attach all kinds of significances to it. These can be expected to be highly personal and subjective. By contrast, my aim in this book is to describe the Kundalini process in terms of what is observable. In the present volume, I present a series of cases, some of which are drawn from a survey of diverse cultures and spiritual traditions, 
while others derive from my own clinical experience as a psychiatrist. Both samples give us ample data for this rounded portrayal of psychophysiological transmutation. Ordinarily, a clinician may present his or her cases with the expectation that they will be accepted more or less at face value, even though the conclusions may be challenged. When I was preparing the first edition of this book in 1976, the climate of medical opinion was such that I had many qualms about publishing my findings. Although the dominant scientific paradigm is still intolerant of the realities encountered in the Kundalini process and spirituality in general, there have been many encouraging developments during the past decade or so. This supports an enlarged view of the human being, which takes at least our psychic capacities, if not our spiritual destiny, into account. I wish to mention specifically the works of Kenneth Pelletier, Larry Dossi, and Gabriel Cousins. I am therefore not in the least hesitant about reissuing my book in the present thoroughly revised and expanded form. Of course, the model proposed here, which is essentially that formulated by Itzhak Bentov, is still subject to review and improvement. In the intervening years, no more convincing model has come to my attention, but this does not mean that a new and better model could not be elaborated. The initial flurry of scientific interest in the Kundalini process unfortunately did not lead to sustained and serious research into this important phenomenon. With the death of Itzhak Bentov in 1981 and Pandit Gopi Krishna in 1986, the Kundalini research has lost its most ardent advocates. It remains to be seen how this embryonic field of investigation will develop. As for the present book, two interconnected theses are strongly argued. The first is that a process of psychophysiological transmutation, most usefully viewed as the awakening of the Kundalini, is indeed a reality. The second is that this process is part of an evolutionary mechanism and that as such it must not be viewed as a pathological development. Rather, I will strongly propose that the Kundalini process is an aspect of human psycho-spiritual unfolding that is intrinsically desirable. The evolutionary potential of the Kundalini process has nowhere been vocalized more than in the writings of Gopi Krishna, 1973. On the basis of first-hand experience of his own awake Kundalini, he made this statement. A new center, presently dormant in the average man and woman, has to be activated and a more powerful stream of psychic energy must rise into the head from the base of the spine to enable human consciousness to transcend the normal limits. This is the final phase of the present evolutionary impulse in man. The cerebrospinal system of man has to undergo a radical change, enabling consciousness to transcend the limits of the highest intellect. Here reason yields to intuition and revelation appears to guide the steps of humankind. I will begin my presentation by discussing the special significance of the transformative process today and by briefly reviewing the problem of objectivity in the description of psycho-spiritual states. Then I will look at the Kundalini as it has been conceptualized in the Tantra Yoga tradition, since it is traditional model that is best known and also more refined than other comparable models. It is, furthermore, quite amenable to a physiological interpretation. However, certain differences between the classical descriptions of the Kundalini and my own data will lead me to distinguish between the traditional Kundalini concept as spiritual energy and what I call the Physio Kundalini. In explaining the Physio Kundalini, I will use, as already mentioned, Itzhak Bentov model. It is the first and so far only model of the Kundalini phenomenon subject to experimental verification. The significance of Bentov's work will be discussed and his original paper on micromotion and the Kundalini is included as appendix one in my discussion of diagnosis. I will show that it is possible to recognize the physio-Kundalini process and to distinguish it from psychosis even when these two conditions are temporarily co-present in a particular individual. This distinction will help make it possible for clinicians to avoid the serious mistakes that have been made in the past. A faulty diagnosis can only further complicate a case, but also deprive the person who has all the symptoms of an awakening or awaked Kundalini of the great transformative and spiritual potential this signals. Individuals undergoing the Kundalini transformation often need special help 
and I will consider which forms of help are advisable and which are not. Finally, I will suggest an approach for coping with the problems and opportunities generated by the Kundalini phenomenon in society as a whole. Here I feel we can be guided by the precedent of Mehir Baba's work with the masts in India. This concluding chapter was adding to this new edition because I wanted to say something about the spiritual relevance of the Kundalini phenomenon. I believe that there is a great deal of confusion about what authentic spirituality is in relation to the whole realm of psychic experiences. The teaching of the contemporary adept Dalov Ananda can serve us in our attempt to disentangle the many misconceptions of the popular mind and to put the Kundalini phenomenon in its proper spiritual context. Appendix 3 poses the fundamental question, why is the transformative process possible at all? Appendixes 4 and 5 are for the use of medical clinicians and specialists respectively. Although the original version of this book was written with medical practitioners in mind, it was widely read by many non-specialists. Judging from the numerous letters and phone calls from my readers, the book has proven helpful to them. I hope that it is in present revised and expanded form, it will be even more useful to many more people. Acknowledgements. This book is, to a large extent, the product of a group effort. In particular, the author wishes to thank Keith Borden, Freda Morris, Henry S. Dakin, Gabriel Cousins, Daniel Kintz, Jean Millet, Richard Lauerberg, Elaine Chernoff, Beverly Johnson, George Meek, James Fadiman, and Itzak Bantov for their advice and assistance in preparing, editing, and reviewing the manuscript and artwork for the first edition, and Shirley Triest and Matt Barna for their help with the cover of this new edition. The participation of many other individuals in the research described in this volume is also gratefully acknowledged, though for reasons of privacy their names are not given. Chapter 1. The Significance of Psychophysiological Transformation Today Half a century ago, in a seminar on the Kundalini, Carl Gustav Jung, 1932, and his colleagues observed that the awakening of this force had rarely, if ever, been witnessed in the West. They suggested, ironically, that it would take a thousand years for the Kundalini to be set in motion by depth analysis. It is hard to believe that the Kundalini phenomenon was unknown in pre-modern Europe, given the long-standing fascination with alchemy as a psycho-spiritual discipline and magic. Can we seriously believe that the ancient Druids, who were Magi and Hierophants, were ignorant of this force? Or that the mystics of ancient and medieval Christendom never experienced the phenomena accompanying its arousal? It is easier to concede that modern death analysis might require a millennium for it to affect a Kundalini awakening. However, remote Jung considered the possibility of an accidental or voluntary arisal of the Kundalini in his day, he certainly had a clear grasp of its psychological significance. He told the allegory of a medieval monk who took a fantasy journey into a wild unknown forest where he lost his way. While trying to retrace his steps, he found his path buried with a fierce dragon. Jung contended that this beast is the symbol of the Kundalini, the force that, in psychological terms, obliges a person to go on his or her greatest adventure, the adventure of self-knowledge. One can only turn back at the cost of sacrificing the momentum of self-discovery and self-understanding which would amount to a loss of meaning, purpose, and consciousness. The awakening of the Kundalini signals one's entry into the unknown forest of hidden dimensions of human existence. As Jung puts it, when you succeed in awakening the Kundalini so that it starts to move out of its mere potentiality, you necessarily start a world which is totally different from our world. 
Jung went on to describe the Kundalini as an impersonal force, which is in consonance with the Hindu sources. He argued that to claim the Kundalini experience as one's own creation is perilous. It leads to ego inflation, false superiority, obnoxiousness, or even madness. For him, the Kundalini is an autonomous process arising out of the unconscious and seemingly using the individual as its vehicle. This transmutative process was, admittedly, rare when Jung first considered it. This is no longer the case. Today, Kundalini awakenings occur more frequently with and without training. What has happened? Some might argue that there has not really been any increase in Kundalini cases at all, but that the intellectual climate has changed and people speak more freely about such experiences. There may be some truth in this, but I venture to suggest that there is another, more significant cause. People experience Kundalini phenomena more frequently because they are actually more involved in disciplines and lifestyles conductive to psycho-spiritual transformation. Since the LSD revolution of the 1960s, the employment of non-rational, not merely irrational, methods of awareness, expansion or intensification has become increasingly acceptable, even fashionable in certain sectors of our Western society. New therapies involving some form of meditative practice has sprung up. Hundreds of thousands of people, we are informed, practice transcendental meditation. Many are engaged in yoga, Vedanta, and the different schools of Buddhism, Zen, Vajrayana, Mahayana, Theravada. An even larger number of people pursue psychic arts like dowsing, channeling, mediumism, magic, witchcraft, and psychic healing. And many more have a passive interest in if not fascination for such matters. Some sociologists speak of an occult revival in our times, others of an East-West encounter, while still others warn of the new narcissism. Most commentators note that our Western civilization is in a state of profound ferment. A growing number of critics read our situation as one of crisis, whose outcome may well determine the destiny of humanity as a whole. Jung, 1964, for instance, pointed out that a period of dissociation is at once an age of death and rebirth. He referred to the end of the Roman Empire as paralleling our own era. Anticipating the revolutionary insights of Ilya Prigumjin, Jung remarked, When one principle reaches the height of its power, the counter-principle is stirring within like a germ. What that principle is which presently being replaced by its counter-principle, we can learn from the works of Louis Mumford, Pierre Taylor de Chardin, Theodore Rodzak, Charles R. Reich, Maurice Berman, and Jean Gebser. They are among those who champion the idea of an emerging new age of new consciousness. And that new consciousness supersedes what Gebser styles of the rational consciousness with a rigid left-brain orientation to life and its anxious defense of the ego as the measure of all things. The French psychiatrist Jacques Lacan has described the ego as a paranoid construct by which self and other are kept apart. This is precisely the orientation that underlies the whole scientific enterprise with its insistence on splitting value from fact, feeling from thinking, amounting to a disenchantment of the world, as Maurice Berman has termed it. However, this entire orientation stands challenged by modern quantum theory and other avant-garde disciplines of science. More than anything, it has been called into question by the very lifestyle to which it has given rise and of which it is an integral part, our deeply troubled Western civilization. The ego-bound rational consciousness is ultimately unfit for life. Not that there is anything intrinsically wrong with the ego or with reason. But where they are made the principles by life is lived, they become destructive. The ego is a necessary stage in the development of the human personality, yet it is by no means its crowning accomplishment. Similarly, reason or rationality is an intrinsic quality or power of the human being. But it is only one among many capacities, and it is by no means the most important one. In fact, both ego and reason are recent appearances in the history of consciousness, and both are destined to be surpassed 
by superior forms of existence. The search for meaning and happiness, which occupies a growing number of Westerners, is the other side of their profound dissatisfaction with the prevalent values, attitudes and forms of life. It is, in the last analysis, a quest for that which lies beyond the boundaries of the ego and reason. Unfortunately, this journey often leads not to a transcendence of the ego and rationality, but to an immature denial of individuality that is accompanied paradoxically by narcissistic preoccupation, ego inflation, and an angry rejection of reason. This is evident in much of the contemporary preoccupation with spiritualism, witchcraft, and magic. I have also witnessed this regrettable tendency among those who have stumbled onto the Kundalini experience. But this says nothing about the experience itself, which is not inherently regressive. On the contrary, I view the Kundalini awakening as an experience that fundamentally serves self-transcendence and mind transcendence. I tend to agree with Gopi Krishna's 1971 appraisal of the Kundalini. He wrote, This mechanism, known as Kundalini, is the real cause of all so-called spiritual and psychic phenomena, the biological basis of evolution and development of personality, the secret origin of all esoteric and occult doctrines, the master key to the unsolved mystery of creation, the inexhaustible source of philosophy, art and science, and the fountainhead of all religious faith, past, present and future. But while I regard the Kundalini as the evolutionary engine par excellence, I do not wish to equate it with the ultimate reality of existence. Chapter 2. The Kundalini Experience and Scientific Objectivity Personal accounts of the awakening of the Kundalini tend to be full of references to emotions, unusual thought processes and visions, while physical signs and symptoms or actual sensations are rarely mentioned. Similarly, vague allusions to subjectively felt energy states and force fields make up most of the descriptions of meditative experiences. For the most part, these accounts merely reiterated standard expectations and formulaic metaphors. Jung, 1975, referred to the adherence to traditional models as a dogmatism that has its origin in the teacher-disciple relationship. Here the master communicates, both in words and often through direct initiation, the esoteric knowledge or vision that the disciple is to discover himself or herself. In other words, the teacher provides a framework of interpretation that then serves the occult as a guiding light in his or her own psycho-spiritual journey. Since intellectual analysis is typically downplayed in traditional schools of esotericism, the discipline tends to make the teacher's conceptual framework his or her own without always looking at the fit between that framework and his or her actual experiencing. And even more independent-minded students who question in the inherited framework of explanation are seldom willing to make radical innovations. It usually takes an accomplished adept or rounded personality of the stature of a Gautama the Buddha or a Jesus of Nazareth to break with tradition in a more obvious way. The dependence on traditional explanation can clearly be seen in the classical accounts of the Kundalini experience, as set forth in the Sanskrit scripture of yoga, notably Hatha Yoga. While this tendency is readily apparent in Eastern writings, it is also true of Western descriptions of psycho-spiritual processes. We have so far failed to clarify the different states of the psyche and the body in regard to transcendental or mystical experiences. There is as yet no commonly accepted phenomenology that will allow us to comprehend such states analytically and comprehensively. For example, William James, 1929, saw in the great German mystic Suso a suffering ascetic incapable of turning his torments into religious ecstasy. He wrote, 
His case is distinctly pathological, but he does not seem to have had the elevation which some ascetics have enjoyed of an alteration of sensibility capable of actually turning torment into a perverse kind of pleasure. By contrast, Jung, 1932, and his colleagues thought Suso had experienced the Kundalini process. These contrasting views would appear to reflect the different interests that James and Jung brought to their study of Suso. James was sensitive to the pathological elements in religious and mystical life, whereas Jung was primarily concerned with the relationship between individuation and the Kundalini. Both James and Jung subscribed to the scientific ideal of objectivity. Nevertheless, both approached the subject of religious experience principally through comparative analysis rather than vigorous personal experimentation or laboratory testing of suitable volunteers. There is, of course, a place for both comparative analysis and experimentation. It is, however, chiefly by means of the latter, either in the form of self-experimentation or the experimental study of others, that we can hope to expose and transcend our own biases and preconceptions about psycho-spiritual processes. In particular, such an objective approach can do away with the common presupposition that psycho-spiritual states have nothing to do with the body. This specific bias belongs to the age-old tradition of dualism, which conceives of a split between body and mind, or body and spirit. Modern psychology and medicine have found the old scientific paradigm of Cartesianism to be inadequate. After denying for several decades the significance and even the reality of consciousness, these disciples are now in the process of reconsidering the very premises on which they have been based. In a nutshell, they are coming to the conclusion that body and mind form a dynamic unity or a polar aspects of a larger reality. This switch is best captured in the humanistic psychology of Abraham Maslow. In one of his landmark essays, he argued that the classical conception of objectivity works tolerably well in only regard to inanimate objects and perhaps lower organisms. When it comes to the animal kingdom and to human beings, the detachment of the cool observer is, as Maslow recognized, virtually impossible. While it is possible to eliminate some of our preconceptions through intense self-examination, Maslow 1983 held that the best possible avenue was to marshal our capacity for love in order to know and understand other beings objectively. He wrote, To the extent that it is possible for us to be non-intrusive, non-demanding, non-hoping, non-improving, to that extent do we achieve this particular kind of objectivity. In the 1950s, scientists began to study altered state of consciousness in the laboratory. The first experiments involved the electroencephalographic study of yogins and Zen practitioners. Later in the 1960s and 1970s, many similar studies were made of TM practitioners. Other tests were also devised to track down the physiological correlates of these elusive psycho-spiritual processes. They included measurements of heart activity and skin resistance. Researchers also encouraged more open and immediate accounts of personal experiences, focusing in particular on somatic changes. This process has led to the important discovery that there is a whole range of phenomena in the process of psycho-spiritual transformation that are constant and universal, transcending personal and cultural differences. This is no less that traditionalists have claimed. It is now possible, however, to begin to distinguish more carefully between personal idiosyncrasies and predictable patterns. This is especially important in view of the fact that today the Kundalini experience does not occur exclusively in an esoteric setting where the teacher monitors the pupil's progress. The uniform aspect of the Kundalini experience, furthermore, are a potent indication that the experience is not illusory but real. The signs and symptoms usually described, such as shifts in emoting and thinking, as well as the experience of visions and the hearing of voices, appear to be largely determined by personal factors, the set, and external circumstances, the setting. But such physical sensation as itching, fluttering, tingling, intense heat and cold, photism, perception of inner lights, 
and the perception of primary sounds as well as the occurrence of spasms and contortions seems to be archetypal features of the process, or at least of certain phases of it. In this universally, that leads me to postulate that all psycho-spiritual practices activate the same basic process and that this process has definite physiological basis. Yet clearly, the emotional aspect of psychophysiological transformation must not be underrated, for it is the source of the personal meanings that each individual experiences in relation to the transformative process. Together with the alterations in the thinking process, the emotional changes have frequently been mistaken for mental illness. But, as I have already explained, to interpret the Kundalini experience as a psychotic state is unwarranted. Although the experience may include pathological episodes or aspects, these must be understood in the context of the totality of the individual's life and the meaningfulness of the Kundalini experience itself. The subjective dimension of the psycho-spiritual process is richly varied, ranging over a broad spectrum of experiential phenomena, from helpless confusion and depression to self-transcendent ecstasy and blissful super-lucidity. The compelling quality of these emotional states tend to overshadow the physiological details so that the experiencer of the Kundalini process is apt to ignore the subtle changing occurring in his or her physical condition. But whereas the intellectual emotional component of the transmutative process is highly diversified, the somatic component is more amenable to systematic study. For the reasons already stated, I will focus on the physiological parameters of the Kundalini arousal, reading them in terms of the model developed by Itzhak Bentov. Chapter 3 the Kundalini experience, the classical model. Every spiritual tradition has its own model of the transformative process. Generally, these models stress the subjective side of the experience, treating the objective signs as incidental or ignoring them altogether. Thus, the traditional descriptions of psycho-spiritual metamorphosis, valid as they may be to initiates, are none too helpful in making objective comparison and in arriving at an overall appraisal of the process. In physiological terms, most of these models have little relevance. There are, however, important exceptions, notably the Tantra Yoga models of the Kundalini experience. According to this Indian tradition, the Kundalini is a type of energy, a power or force, Shakti, that is held to rest in a dormant or potential state in the human body. Its location is generally specified as being at the base of the spine. When this energy is galvanized, awaked, it rushes upward along the central axis of the human body or along the spinal column to the crown of the head. Occasionally, it is thought to go even beyond the head. Upon arriving there, the Kundalini is said to give rise to the mystical states of consciousness, which is indescribably blissful and in which all awareness of duality ceases. According to Tantra Yoga Metaphysics, the Kundalini resident in the individual body is an aspect of the transcendental power that precedes and yet also pervades the entire cosmos. It is that power. But this realization is only made when the Kundalini has fully ascended from the bodily base to its optimal position at the crown of the head or beyond. Tantra Yoga understands this whole process as a play between the two fundamental aspects of the ultimate reality. One aspect is called the power or Shakti and the other is called God Shiva. The Sanskrit word Shiva means literally tranquil. In Tantra Yoga, it refers to the static masculine pole or aspect of the ultimate reality, whereas the word Shakti designates the dynamic feminine pole. Shiva stands for pure, object-transcending and self-transcending consciousness, and Shakti stands for the world-creating power of consciousness. On the transcendental level, both aspects are forever inseparable. Shiva and Shakti are always in ecstatic embrace. 
but on the level of normal human consciousness, they appear separated. Hence, the ordinary individual has only a trickle of that transcendental power available, just as he or she experiences only a fraction of that transcendental consciousness in the form of individuated awareness. Sir John Woodruff, 1929, alias Arthur Avalon, who pioneered the study of Tantra Yoga, offered this explanation. Whatever is felt and known, hoped and wished, in fact, all the varied experiences of the limited self appear and disappear, rise and fall, like waves in an infinite sea of consciousness. Man's spiritual existence is never at any moment simply the aggregates of the modes of experience that he may have at that moment. For pragmatic reasons, he commonly ignores many of the modes themselves. He is commonly partial to a few and regards these as all he possesses at that moment. But these are not all that is ignored. What is generally ignored, though, it can ever be for a single moment effaced or shut out. It is the placid background or atmosphere of consciousness in which all appearances take place. This indeed is the questioned, placid aspect of man's being, the Shiva aspect. Against it, we have the stressing, dynamical, moving and changing aspect, the Shakti aspect. He explains further. Power is that aspect of consciousness in which it stresses and changing as the world order. As such changing action is commonly called action or movement, power is regarded as the moving, acting, dynamical aspect of consciousness. If consciousness, which is the essence of power, be veiled, that is unrecognized, then power is the creative impulse that continuously changing as the world there being no rest, no endurance, no permanence, but it is essentially a power of consciousness. Not only does Shakti presuppose Shiva, Shakti is Shiva. Elsewhere, Woodruff, 1978, observed that the doctrine of Shakti is a profound one, which is likely to be attractive to Western minds when they have grasped it. He was not mistaken, for lately we encountered the Shiva Shakti metaphor in the literature of the new physics. It took the revolutionary findings of quantum physics for Western scientists to begin to appreciate Eastern cosmological thinking, which views reality as a process of polar dynamics that unfolds against the backdrop of a single continuum. This reality appears not to be material, but supermaterial or as some avant-garde physicists argue, supermaterial and superconscious. Like all ancient teachings, Tantra Yoga looks upon the individual human being as a faithful reflection of the macrocosm. The universal, non-local power is present in the human body-mind at a location corresponding to the Aino region. This is the position of the first of the seven principal centers or seats of power arrayed along the body's axis. These centers or chakras, wheels, are commonly depicted as lotus flowers with varying numbers of petals set to correspond to different forms of energy associated with each center. These foci are, as it were, the organs or limbs of the power. They are localized vortices of bioenergy. The center at the anus bears the technical name of root prop center, Muladhara Chakra. It is traditionally held to be associated with the earth element, the sense of smell, the feet, and the general distribution of the life force, prana, in the body. The second center in ascending order is the so-called Svadhisthana Chakra, which is located in the genital area. The name is, like many esoteric Sanskrit terms, difficult to translate. It means roughly own standing center, referring to the genitals as the most obvious characteristic of the human body. This focal point of the power is thought to be associated with the traditional water element, the sense of taste, the hands, and sexuality. The third center is called Manipura Chakra or the center of the gem city. It is situated in the region of the navel, which in some traditions 
is given as an alternative resting place for the dormant Kundalini. The center is commonly said to be connected with the traditional fire element, digestion, the anus, and curiously, with the sense of sight. The fourth center at the heart is frequently referred to as heart lotus, but as the anahata chakra. The word anahata literally means unstruck and is an esoteric designation for the eternal sound OM. The sound is not generated by any causal mechanisms, but the experienced yogin can perceive it by focusing his attention on the heart lotus. The center is explained as being associated with the traditional air elements, the sense of touch, feelings, the genitals, and the stimulation of the life force. The fifth center, which is situated as the throat, is known as the Vishuddhi Chakra or center of purity. It is said to be connected with the traditional ether element, the sense of hearing, the mouth and the skin. The sixth center depicted as a two petal lotus located at the forehead between the brows is the Ajna Chakra or command center. It is also known as the third eye. It is commonly regarded as being associated with the mind, manas, It is in the center that the teacher is said to contact the disciple telepathically. The seventh and final center of this main sequence is the Sahasrara Chakra. The word Sahasrara is composed of Sahasra, meaning thousand, and Ara, meaning spoke. The thousand spokes or energy pathways of the center, which is located at the crown of the head, are representative of the experience of overwhelming light and bliss that results when the kundalini force rises from the low center to the crown center. In the Sanskrit literature, the center is described as lustrous, richer than the full moon, shedding a constant and profuse stream of nectar. Gopi Krishna 1971 confirmed this. Whenever I turn my mental eye upon myself, I invariably perceived a luminous glow within and outside my head in a state of constant vibration, as if a jet of an extremely subtle and brilliant substance rising through the spine spread itself out in the cranium, filling and surrounding it with an indescribable radiance. Light, as we shall see, is an important aspect of the Kundalini awakening. It is one of the constants of psycho-spiritual experience and has been reported by mystics of all religious traditions. Another important part of the Tantra Yoga model of the Kundalini process is the notion of three major ducts or pathways along which the aroused Kundalini force can travel. These are the so-called nadis. One is said to be experienced at the straight pathways connecting all the seven major centers. The other two wrap around in helix fashion. The central duct is known as the Sushumna Nadi. The channel starting at the left of it in the lowest center is called the Ida Nadi, and the one starting to the right of it is called the Pingala Nadi. The two helical channels pass each other at the various centers until they merge in Ajna Chakra. According to traditional explanations, the right channel has a heating function, whereas the left channel is thought to cool the body. They clearly correspond on the physiological plane to the two nervous systems, the sympathetic and parasympathetic, respectively. I use the word correspond advisedly because some yoga authorities insist that the pathways cannot simply be identified with the nervous system. Rather, there are subtle esoteric phenomena to be experienced and understood only in meditative state. The scriptures of Tantrism and Hatha Yoga are very emphatic about the fact that, in order to avoid unpleasant and even dangerous side effects, the awakened Kundalini must be guided through the central channel alone. As it ascends in it, the different centers become active, and according to some authorities, they actually come into existence only at that moment. As the aroused Kundalini current passes through each center, it temporarily energizes it, and then, as it moves on, absorbs its energy. By the time the Kundalini forces reaches the topmost center, the rest of the body is depleted of bioenergy. The lower extremities tend to become cold and corpse-like. 
This physiological phenomenon contrasts most strikingly with the intense experience of bliss, light, and super lucidity associated with the entry of the Kundalini current in the topmost center. This experience is one of catalepsy, but of formless ecstasy or nirvikalpa samadhi. At first, the full ascent of the Kundalini force lasts for only a brief period, perhaps seconds or minutes. Then the Kundalini moves back into one or the other lower center. It is the objective of Tantra Yoga to repeat this elevated state as often as possible until the Kundalini resides permanently in the crown center. The yogin is typically advised to consciously guide the descending kundalini and have it come to rest not lower than the heart center. Kundalini activity in the lower three center is commonly thought to be fraught with dangers, including ego inflation and rampant sexual desire. The idea behind the arousal of the kundalini is that it includes the body in the process of psycho-spiritual transformation. This is how to make the final ecstatic accomplishment more complete. In Tantra Yoga, the body is not regarded as an obstacle to spiritual aspiration. It is looked upon as a temple of the divine. One is reminded of Albert Einstein, 1949, remarked that those who would preserve the spirit must also look after the body to which it is attached. This meshes with the great Tantric doctrine that the unconditional reality, nirvana, and the finite existence, samsara, are ultimately identical. This identity is discovered when limited self-consciousness is transcended in yogic ecstasy. Chapter 4. The Physio Kundalini The arousal of the Kundalini power is a dramatic occurrence. It is traditionally looked upon as a mighty process of purification that leads to the transcendence of the body and the mind in the culminating state of ecstatic unification of subject and object. In the course of its upward motion, the Kundalini is held to encounter all kinds of impurities that are burnt off by its dynamic activity. In particular, the Sanskrit scriptures mention three major structural blockages known as knots. According to traditional understanding, these knots are located at the lowest center in the anal area, the heart center, and the center between and behind the eyebrows. The yogin is instructed to pierce through each knot by way of single-minded concentration and focused breath. But the pathway of the kundalini can be blocked anywhere along its upward trajectory. We can look upon these blockages as stress points. Thus, in its ascent, the kundalini causes the central nervous system to throw off stress. This is usually associated with the experience of pain. When the Kundalini encounters these blocks, it works away at them until they are dissolved. This best demonstrates the self-directing behavior of the aroused Kundalini. It appears to act at its own volition, spreading through the entire psychophysiological system to affect its transformation. Once a blockage is removed, the Kundalini flows freely through that point and continues its upward journey until it meets with the next area of stress. Moreover, the Kundalini energy appears to diffuse so that it may be operating on several levels at once, removing several different stress points simultaneously. The Kundalini moves inexorably upward until it reaches the center at the crown of the head. However diffused the Kundalini energy may have been in the course of its ascent, once the topmost center is reached, it becomes focused. We can understand this process as being analogous to the phenomenon of electricity. An electrical current produces light when it passes through a thin tungsten filament, but not when it travels through a thick copper wire, because the filament offers appreciable resistance while the wire does not. 
Similarly, the Kundalini produces the most striking sensations when it encounters a part of the psychophysiological system that offers particular resistance. But the heat generated by the friction of the Kundalini against this resistance soon burns out the blockage and then the sensations cease. There's another way of looking at this process. An intense flow of water through a small rubber hose will cause the hose to whip about violently, whereas the same flow through a wire hose will scarcely be noticeable. Likewise, the flow of the Kundalini energy through restricted areas of the body-mind causes turbulence, which may be experienced as painful sensations. Of course, these are all metaphors. The actual Kundalini process is undoubtedly far more subtle and complex than either electricity or water rushing through a hose. However, it is possible to understand a whole range of Kundalini phenomena in strictly physiological and physical terms. This is exactly what Itzhak Bentov, whose model accounts for much of what I and others have observed about the Kundalini process, has done. The spontaneous bodily movements, shifting somatic sensations, and other phenomena reported in the following cross-cultural survey and case studies can all readily be interpreted as byproducts of Kundalini activity. And Bentov's model offers the best explanation available. I need to emphasize, however, that there are differences between my clinical observations and the classical model of the Kundalini process. The most striking difference concerns the movement of the Kundalini energy through the body-mind. According to the traditional scriptures of yoga and chantrism, the Kundalini rises from the center at the base of the spine along the spinal axis to the crown of the head. By contrast, my clinical data and also some traditional non-Hindu accounts point to a movement of the Kundalini proceeding from the feet and legs along the back of the trunk or along the spine to the head and from there down over the face, through the throat and terminating in the abdomen. Thus, in Taoist yoga, as described by Charles Locke, 1972, alias Yu Kuang Yu, the microcosmic orbit of the inner fire begins at the base of the spine, rises through the brain, and from there returns to its starting point. This is entirely in accord with predictions from Bentov's model. The question now is, how is the difference between Bentov's model and the classical Kundalini model to be explained? Two main possibilities suggest themselves. One may assume that two related but essentially different processes are at work here. Or one may assume that the underlying process is the same and that the differences are merely incidental. The first assumption is less likely since the descriptions are too similar. If the second explanation is correct, which I suggest, one still needs to account for the differences. One can speculate that the differences would, could simply be due to incorrect or inadequate self-observation and description. Could it be that those who have had spontaneous Kundalini awakenings without knowledge of the classical Hindu explanations simply did not have the right language to express what they were experiencing? Or could it be that those pursuing Kundalini arousal in the context of the classical model somehow overdetermined their experiences? The second explanation seems to me far more likely. Language structures or experience. Once we've accepted a particular model as a faithful reflection of reality, we cease to think of it in terms of a model and instead equate it with reality. The yogi who applies himself to the age-old techniques of Kundalini arousal inevitably does so on the basis of the classical model of the Kundalini. He fully expects the Kundalini energy to awaken in the basal center and to travel upward to the crown center, where it generates untold bliss. It is therefore very likely that he would ignore any phenomena that do not fit the prescription. More than that, he may not even consciously experience any such phenomena because his attention is focused on a different aspect of the total process. By the same token, it seems highly likely that those who undergo spontaneous Kundalini awakenings without preconceived notions about this process are the better observers. They will notice phenomena that, 
from the classical viewpoint, have no significance or do not even exist. They do not hold in their heads the yogin's elaborate metaphysical framework, which acts as a reality filter. Hence, they are more sensitive to the unique manifestations of the Kundalini experience, certainly on the somatic level. At the same time, however, they are apt to be at a disadvantage when it comes to exploring the deeper spiritual possibilities of the process. The reason is that, lacking the classical background, they are also unfamiliar with the full Kundalini potential as it has been realized by some adepts. Indeed, they may subscribe to the materialistic philosophy that forms the backbone of our Western civilization and in this case they would not even consider their experience in a higher light. Instead, they would fear, as many of my clients have done, for their own sanity. The Kundalini process holds many secrets. There is much that I, as a physician, do not understand about it. Therefore, it seems advisable to focus on those aspects about which something useful can be said. And this is the physiological dimension of the Kundalini experience. I propose to apply the term Physio-Kundalini to those aspects of the Kundalini process which can be accounted for in purely physiological terms. The Physio-Kundalini is, then, the slow progression of energy sensation originating in the lower part of the body and rising through into the head and proceeding down through the throat into the abdomen where this stimulus reaches its culmination point. I will also refer to this complex phenomenon as the physio-kundalini process or cycle or mechanism. When the kundalini energy encounters a resistance in its path and then overcomes it and purifies the psychophysiological system of that block, I will speak of an opening of that particular location. The opening of the throat is a typical example. This terminology is adequately descriptive and amenable to physiological interpretation. It even offers contact points with the classical model of the Kundalini process without committing us to metaphysical and idealized descriptions of that model. Chapter 5 Cross-cultural aspects of the Kundalini experience. The Kung of Africa. Northwest Botswana is the home of the Kung people of the Kalahari Desert. The American anthropologist Richard Katz, 1973, has given us an insightful account of the mystical practices of these people. He described how the Kung dance for many hours in order to heat up the Num so that the Kia state can be attained. Katz noted that the Num is analogous to the Kundalini. Kia is the condition of transcendence. This state goes beyond what is generally called a peak experience, in which the ordinary waking consciousness is temporarily transcended to make room for ecstatic feelings, highs. It is more what Abraham Maslow in 1973 termed plateau experience, in which one's whole being participates consciously or supraconsciously and joyously in the larger life in which is thoroughly transformative. The Kiya condition is thus similar to the Zen Satori or certain forms of Indian Samadhi that are not necessarily accompanied by loss of sensory awareness. The Kung tribesman who has been initiated into the secrets of Num is taught how to arouse this power and how to conquer the inevitable fear he will encounter in the face of the tremendous inner force that threatens to eclipse his self-sense. Once he has crossed over this threshold of fear, he enters in the Kia state. Num is said to reside in the pit of the stomach. As it warms up, it rises from the base of the spine to the skull, and it is there that the Kia state is attained. According to Katz 1973, one tribesman offers this report. You dance, 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 then Num lifts you in your belly and lifts you in your back, and then you start to shiver. Num makes you tremble, it's hot. Your eyes are open, but you don't look around. You hold your eyes still and look straight ahead. But when you get into Kia, you're looking around because you see everything. 
because you see what's troubling everybody. Rapid, shallow breathing, that's what draws Noom up. And then Noom enters every part of your body, right to the tip of your feet and even your hair. Another tribesman puts it this way. In your backbone, you feel a pointed something and it works its way up. Then the base of your spine is tingling, 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 tingling. And then it makes your thoughts nothing in your head. At the height of the key estates, a new master can perform a variety of extraordinary feats, such as curing the sick and handing or walking on fire. He may also develop remote vision, enabling him to see over vast distances. One new master said that when he's in the key estate, I can really become myself again, implying that these different paranormal abilities are natural human capacities. By transcending his ordinary consciousness of self-sense, a new master is, above all, able to contact the supernatural realm and combat the ghosts that, in the Kung cosmology, are responsible for illness. The struggle with these ghosts is at the heart of the new master's art, skill and power. Healing is, for him, a matter of winning the battle against the personified forces that cause sickness. As Katz pointed out, the Kung seek Kia not merely for their own personal enrichment, but primarily to help others. Nor is the Kia state sought as a permanent refuge from ordinary life. On the contrary, a tribesman is expected to soon return to the ordinary state and its responsibilities. An extended Kia is not seen as a state of grace, but as a mistake. Kia is to be sought for entering the sacred dimension of existence, receiving its nourishment and then sharing with one's fellow beings what has been received in the process of healing. The sole criterion for determining who becomes an adept in the num process is the process itself. Every individual who experiences num and is able to attain the Kia condition is automatically considered to be a num master. It is recognized that the more feeling a person is and the richer his powers of imagination are, the more likely he is to Kia, that is to transcend his ordinary state. Over half the members of the Kung tribe can attain the Kia state and this ability seems to run in families. The arousal of Num is connected with fear and pain and it is quite unpredictable. The Kung believe that a Num master can create Num in a student and also control the process so that the excessive fear that accompanies the arousal does not prevent the occurrence of Kia. The Kung regard Num as a gift from the gods, though it now passes from person to person. Saint Therese, a Christian mystic. In her autobiography, Saint Therese of Lisieux, 1962, who lived from 1873 to 1897, describes how she suffered phenomena that are similar to those observed in cases of spontaneous Kundalini awakening. Therese hailed from a middle-class French family with apparently happily married parents and four sisters. At age 10, she became a student at a nearby Carmelite convent. A few months after her enrollment, she developed constant headaches. One evening, while preparing for bed, she began to shiver uncontrollably. These spells continued for a week and were uninfluenced by any treatment. The shivering was not accompanied by fever and it disappeared as mysteriously as it had come. A few weeks later, however, she was stricken with a strange melange of hallucinations, comas and convulsions. She appeared to be in delirium, crying out against unseen and terrifying creatures. She tossed violently in bed, hitting her head on the bedboards as if some strange force were assailing her. These convulsions, which sometimes resembled the contortion of a gymnast, were occasionally so violent that she would be thrown out of bed. There were watery or tumbling movements of her whole body that were quite beyond her normal flexibility. For instance, she would spring from her knees and stand on her head without the use of her hands. Later, during Mass, she had a more severe attack that ceased only after her earnest prayer. What is perhaps most remarkable is the fact that despite this violence attack, involving bizarre contortions and duration of the body, she was never physically harmed. On occasion, she would plunge head first onto the floor or be dashed against the headboard of her bed and yet remain unhurt. This strange illness lasted less than two months, 
Subsequently, two more incidents of fainting and rigidity occurred that lasted for only a few moments. Throughout all this, Therese claimed she never lost awareness, even during the fainting spell, but that she had no control over her bodily activity, in her own words. I was delirious nearly all the time and talking utter nonsense, and yet I'm quite certain that I never for a moment lost the use of my reason. Often I seemed to be in a dead faint without making the slightest movement. Anybody could do anything they liked to me, you could have killed me unresisting. And yet all the time I heard everything that was being said around me and I remember it all still. Saint Therese was attended regularly by a competent physician who was unable to help her and frankly admitted to being confused by her symptoms. He was, however, firm in his opinion that it was not hysteria. Therese herself condemned her terrifying experiences as the work of the devil. In retrospect, we may more benignly see in it the symptoms of a spontaneous kundalini arousal that were not properly understood. How many other saints in the Christian tradition underwent similar experiences for which neither medicine nor theology had any satisfactory explanation? Psychosomatic heat Heat as psychosomatic heat makes its appearance in numerous religious traditions of the world. As Mirza Elaid in 1968 observed, here we touch upon an extremely important problem concerning not only Indian religious, but the history of religion in general. The excess of power, the magical religious force, is experienced as a very vivid warmth. This is no longer a question of the myths and symbols of power, but of an experience which modifies the very physiology of the ascetic. There is every reason to believe that this experience was known by the mystics and magicians of the most ancient times. A great many primitive tribes conceived the magical religious power as burning and express it by terms that signify heat, burn, very hot, etc. Eliad, 1968, further noted, it must be remembered, too, that all over the world, shamans and sorcerers are reputedly masters of fire and swallow burning embers, handle red-hot iron and walk over fire. On the other hand, they exhibit great resistance to cold. The shamans of the Arctic regions, as well as the ascetics of the Himalayas, thanks to their magical heat, perform feats of resistance to cold that passes imagination. Many traditions notably Tibetan, Vajrayana, Buddhism, and Chinese Taoism, have developed elaborate theories and practices revolving around the manipulation of the psychosomatic heat. In Tibet, for example, the yoga of heat, Tumo, is counted as one of the six great approaches to enlightenment. It is also valued by the Tibetan monks for its useful side effect of keeping them warm in the middle of winter. Master of this yoga is known to be able to dry wet sheets on their body at excessively low temperatures. The Taoist tradition has developed a complex physiological alchemy which uses the inner heat, huo, to increase one's vitality so as to accomplish the creation of the indestructible diamond body. Evelyn Underhill, 1961, in her widely acclaimed study, mentions that heat experience of Richard Rowe of Hempel, the father of English mysticism. In his work, Fire of Love, Rowe wrote, Heat soothly I call when the mind truly is kindled in love everlasting, and the heart on the same manner to burn, not hopingly, but verily is felt. The heart truly turned into fire, gives feelings of burning love. Rowe himself was amazed at the intensity of the experience, which was not purely mental or imaginary, but had a strong physical manifestation. In the prologue to his work, he remarked that, Oft have I groped my breast, seeing whether this burning were of any bodily cause outwardly. The same painful sensation of heat is reported by a modern mystic, Irina Tweedy, 1979, who was apprenticed by an Indian Sufi teacher. In her spiritual autobiography, she has the following diary entry. Burning currents of the fire inside, cold shivers running outside, along the spine, 
wave after wave over legs, arms, abdomen, making all the hair rise. It is as if the whole frame were full of electricity. Another entry reads, The power inside my body did not abate all night and I could not sleep. I noticed something completely new. My blood was getting luminous and I saw its circulation throughout the body. I soon then became aware that it was not only the blood, a light, a bluish white light was running along another system. The light came out of the body and re-entered it again at different points. Observing closely, I could see that there were countless points of light, like a luminous web encircling the body inside and out. It was very beautiful. No bones existed, the body was built on the web of light. Soon, however, I became aware that the body seemed to be on fire. This liquid light was cold, but it was burning me, as if currents of hot lava were flowing through every nerve and every fiber, more and more unbearable and luminous, faster and faster. Shimmering, fluctuating, expanding and contracting, I could do nothing but lie there watching helplessly as the suffering and intense heat increased with every second, burnt alive. Baleki Behari, 1971, cites two examples from the Sufi literature that are also worth noting here because they involve a degree of externalization of that inner heat. Then the saint came to take a meal and the girl was pouring water on his hands. She noticed that so intense was the fire of separation burning in him that immediately the water would fall on his hands, it would pass into vapor. By troth I see, as the physician tries to touch my hand, his hand is burnt and patches and swellings immediately appear on it. Such is the heat of the fire of separation. He alone knoweth my condition, who hath endured such pain cheerfully when it fell to his lot. Tony Akpoa, a Philippine psychic surgeon who has received much public attention, told me in a convention in 1974 that he had learned to ignite fires by mental means as part of his training as a healer. In recent times, many occurrences of spontaneous combustion have been reported. Hernani G. Andrade, 1975, of the Brazilian Institute for Psychobiophysical Research, investigated many fires that occurred spontaneously. Some of them were witnessed by police officers, I myself experienced such a case. I spent two years investigating poltergeist case involving frequent fires. In one instance, the poltergeist phenomena occurred when a son was born to a young Jewish man and his Catholic wife. The intermarriage was surrounded by familiar conflicts and the situation was highly charged emotionally. The poltergeist activity first centered on the baby, symbols of the marriage and religious artifacts. Then the young husband decided to convert to Catholicism. This, together with the more and more destructive Portuguese phenomena, threw the families into great turmoil. The family members of four generations and several other people witnessed a range of paranormal events, including the spontaneous movement and disappearance of objects. The young couple suffered sensation of being struck, shaken, scratched, and choked. The girl's mother was struck and knocked unconscious one evening and had to be hospitalized. There were a number of spontaneous fires witnessed by each family member and by several investigators. My first experience happened one night when the grandfather went into the bedroom to check on the baby and found the curtains ablaze. He and I burned our hands slightly in putting the fire out. I was also present when several other small fires broke out. After the young man converted to Catholicism, avidly invested his energy in the church and secured an official exorcism, the phenomena ceased. One may look upon these cases as possible examples of how pent-up psychosomatic energy can become externalized, since heat is one of the regular manifestations of an active kundalini. It is also more easily observed and measured than other physiological changes during this process. Upon reaching the crown center, the heat produced by the ascent of the Kundalini makes way for the experience of intense luminosity as an accompaniment of ecstatic illumination. The experience of light. 
The experience of light can be called a universal constant of spiritual or mystical experiencing. It is also associated with the ascent of the Kundalini power into the crown center or Sahasraha chakra. This is how Gopi Krishna 1971 described that phenomenon. Whenever I turned my mental eye upon myself, I invariably perceived a luminous glow within and outside my head in a state of constant vibration, as if a jet of an extremely subtle and brilliant substance rising through the spine spread itself out in the cranium, filling and surrounding it with an indescribable radiance. It is no accident that the highest mystical realization is generally referred to as illumination or enlightenment. Mystics and the realizer of all ages have spoken of the radiance aspect of their spiritual state, which is a literal experience for them. The experience of the inner light is also an integral part of shamanism. Thus the Eskimos know of a mystical condition that they call kyomanek, meaning lightning or illumination without which a man cannot become a shaman. The strange light fills the shaman's head and body, and it is thought to enable him to see at great distances in the dark and even into the future. In the ancient Chadogya Upanishad, one of the earliest esoteric scriptures of Hinduism, the transcendental self is said to reside as the inner light, in the region of the heart. According to Mahayana Buddhism, Gautama, the founder of Buddhism, awakened to the enlightened condition as he, after another night of watchful meditation, raised his eyes to the sky where he perceived the morning star. The star symbolizes the clear light or the universal reality beyond all forms. It is this clear light that the Tibetan Buddhist masters admonish the faithful to keep their attention during the death process. According to the Latita Vistara, a traditional biography of the Buddha, a ray of light would rise from the crown of Gautama's head whenever he sat absorbed in deepest meditation. This reminds one of the verse of the 14th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, which states that when there is real knowledge or wisdom, the body emanates light. The same claim is made by the Chinese sage Chuang Tzu. In the famous 11th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, there is a beautiful description of Prince Arjuna's enlightenment experience. He was overwhelmed by a vision of the radiant glory of God Krishna, symbolizing the ultimate reality. Arjuna experienced the divine as a mass of brilliance, flaming all round, entirely a brilliant radiance of sunfire. Not all experiences of non-physical light necessarily indicate the ultimate condition of enlightenment or perfect self-transcendence. The mystical traditions of the world will also recognize so-called photistic experiences or experiences of inner and seemingly external lights without going beyond the subject-object division. The adepts of Hatha Yoga and Tantrism have developed complex visualization techniques in which photism play an important role. They are taken as steps toward the realization of the uncreated light. Similarly, the Taoist masters have elaborated practices for circulating the inner light by which the golden flower is opened and the elixir of immortality is obtained. In early Christianity, the rite of baptism was known as photismus or illumination. The Holy Ghost came to be represented as a flame. As Christian legend has it, when Jesus was baptized in the river Jordan, the water was set on fire. According to an ancient tradition, a true monk literally shines with the light of grace. Many stories are told of monks who, absorbed in prayer, would radiate light. The Taoist Tradition The Kundalini phenomenon is well known in the Chinese Taoist tradition. It is thought that after one has learned to achieve stillness of mind, hitherto dormant virtues or abilities will manifest themselves. The vital principle, known as qi, which is equivalent to the Sanskrit concept of prana, is accumulated in the lower belly through a variety of mental and bodily disciplines. When control over the mind is achieved, this qi or life force bursts out and begins to flow in the main channels of the body, causing involuntary movements, physical automatisms. The conductivity of the qi is also said to produce the following eight sensations, 
pain, itching, coldness, warmth, weightlessness, heaviness, roughness, and smoothness. The life force is hot, and it not only spreads its heat to different parts of the body, but it may even become bright and perceptible to the mediator. In exceptional meditators, you can occasionally cast an objectively visible light. When the life force moves into obstructed areas, it induces painful and rather unpleasant sensations of roughness and cramping. Lu Kuan Yu, alias Charles Luck, reported of the Taoist master Yin Shi Tzu as writing in 1914 that he felt great heat going from the base of his spine to the top of his head, then down over his face and throat to his stomach. His whole body turned and twisted, and he saw a variety of internal lights. He had headaches, and one time his head felt swollen. The upper part of his body seemed to stretch so that he felt ten feet tall. This is spoken of as the great body in Buddhist scriptures. Yin Shi Tzu remarked that he did not experience these various sensations all at once, but encountered one or the other of them at different times during meditation. Sometimes the circulating heat felt more like vibration following the described path. Once, for a period of six months, he experienced nightly involuntary yogic postures that occurred in an orderly sequence. In the Korean Zen tradition, this same progression of sensation is reported. Thus, the Korean Zen master and politician, Dr. Seo, informed me in 1974 that the chi energy travels up the body, especially the back, then over the top of the head to the face, finally passing down through the throat to terminate in the abdomen. Ouroboros The Ouroboros, the serpent swallowing its own tail, is an ancient symbol. It stands for the continuity or great principle of life, the union between heaven and earth. Occasionally, the body of this self-engulfing serpent is drawn half-light and half-dark, similar to the Chinese symbol of yin-yang, indicating both the play of polarities in nature and the reconciliation of apparent opposites. In the later sense, the Ouroboros served as an important symbol in the Gnostic tradition, whose initiates aspired to a unified consciousness, transcending the egoic personality and mind. It was this archetypal symbol that the 19th century German chemist Kekul saw in a dream and which gave him the idea that the molecular structure of benzene was a close carbon ring. In the modern esoteric school of Arica, founded by Oscar Isacho, the Ouroboros is an exercise in which energy is generated in the lower abdomen through controlled breathing. On inhalation, one focuses on the perineural area, first sensing and then directing the energy up the spine to the back of the head. Then the energy curves over the skull and with the expired breath begins its downward path. It moves through the center of the head to the forehead where it splits at the eyes and descends along the sides of the nose and upper lip to meet again at the chin. A similar splitting of the energy occurs according to the Korean Zen teaching, and we may also have a hidden reference to this phenomenon in the ancient Egyptian symbol of the Eye of Osiris. From the chin, the energy continues down the front of the throat through the breastbone until it reaches the lower abdomen. The energy automatically travels the final distance from the abdomen to the genitals in due course. The purpose of this exercise is to see a light either in the head or traveling through the circuit. Some classical accounts of Kundalini arousal. Swami Narayananda, 1960, author of the first detailed book on the Kundalini experience, distinguished between a partial and a full arousal of the Kundalini energy. Whereas partial arousal can lead to all kinds of physical and mental complications, only the Kundalini's complete ascent to the center at the crown of the head will awaken the true impulse to God-realization or liberation and bring about the desired revolution in consciousness. Only then can the body-mind be transcended in the unalloyed bliss of enlightenment. The arousal of the Kundalini power is accompanied by different sensations and experiences. 
Swami Nalayananda in 1960 has compiled a list of symptoms from which the following points are taken. Point 1. There is a strong burning, first along the back and then over the whole body. Point 2. The Kundalini's entrance into the central spinal canal, called Sushumna, is attendant with pain. Swami Narayananda makes a special point of mentioning that this and any of the other disturbing phenomena should not be taken as a sign of disease. Point 3. When the Kundalini reaches the heart, one may experience palpitations. Point 4. One feels a creepy sensation from the toes and sometimes the whole body starts to shake. The rising sensation may feel like an ant crawling slowly up the body toward the head, or like a snake wiggling along, or a bird hopping from place to place, or like a fish darting through calm water, or like a monkey leaping to a far branch. All these signs are mentioned in the traditional scriptures of Hinduism, notably those of yoga and tantrism. That in itself could be an argument for the objective nature of the Kundalini. Saint Ramakrishna, one of modern India's greatest virtuosos of mysticism, described his Kundalini experiences in strikingly similar terms. Speaking of the various ecstatic states to which he was naturally inclined, he is reported to have said, In these samadhis, one feels the sensation of the spiritual current to be like the movement of an ant, a fish, a monkey, a bird, or a serpent. Sometimes the spiritual current rises through the spine, crawling just like an ant. Sometimes, in samadhi, the soul swims joyfully in the ocean of divine ecstasy, like a fish. Sometimes, when I lie down on my side, I feel the spiritual current pushing me like a monkey and playing with me joyfully. I remain still. That current, like a monkey, suddenly, with one jump, reaches to Sahasraha, crown center. That is why you see me jump up with a start. Sometimes again, the spiritual current rises like a bird hopping from one branch to another. The place where it rests feels like fire. Sometimes the spiritual current moves up like a snake. Going in a zigzag way, at last it reaches the head and I go into samadhi. A man's spiritual consciousness is not awakened until his kundalini is aroused. The work of another Hindu authority, Swami Vishnu Trita, 1962, is noteworthy insofar as it builds a bridge between the classical traditions of yoga and its modern proponents. This holy man described the signs of Kundalini awakening in vivid personal terms. His description covers all the different sensory systems as well as the various motor and other manifestations. Another autobiography that documents a spontaneous Kundalini awakening is that of Gopi Krishna, 1971, a teacher and administrator in Kashmir. In addition to making many valuable self-observations, Gopi Krishna's book also includes a psychological commentary by James Hillman who compares the Kundalini experience with the Jungian model of psychosis. Although Gopi Krishna had had psychic experiences as a child, he became an agnostic as a young man. Nevertheless, he meditated regularly for many years. He had no mystical experiences of any kind until 1937, when he was 34 years old. At that time, he experienced a spontaneous arousal of the Kundalini power that radically changed his life. From then on, he remained constantly aware of his consciousness as a luminous field, waxing and waning mysteriously. Then, in 1943, he had a powerful Kundalini experience leading to ecstatic unification or samadhi. He wrote of that event, I distinctly felt an incomparably blissful sensation in all my nerves moving from the tips of finger and toes and other parts of the trunk and limbs towards the spine, where concentrated and intensified, it mounted upwards with a still more exquisitely pleasant feelings to pour into the upper region of the brain a rapturous and exhilarating stream of a rare radiating nerve secretion. In the absence of a more suitable appellation, I call it nectar. This blissful sensation vanished when he paid attention to it, 
but it would flow upward with a growing intensity so long as he ignored it. Suddenly, with a roar like that of a waterfall, he felt a stream of liquid light entering his brain through the spinal cord. His body began to rock and he was enclosed in a halo of light. He became one with his surroundings and was overwhelmed with bliss. This was followed by feelings of terror, weakness and indifference to people. His mouth tasted bitter, his throat felt scorched and frequently his whole body felt as if it was pierced by countless hot pins. He suffered from insomnia. In the dark he noted a reddish glow around himself. At times this was associated with severe back pains. He felt that the Kundalini was operating in the wrong manner and that he might die. Once the Kundalini process had been awaked in him, Gopi Krishna was completely at its mercy. It took many years before he attained the state of physical balance and equanimity. But once the active Kundalini was stabilized, it formed the basis for the gradual development of an extraordinary mental gift, creativity and tranquility. It also led to all kinds of mystical experiences. Early on, he experienced a dramatic expansion of his body image. I felt as if I were looking at the world from a higher elevation than that from which I saw it before. He was also able to perceive his environment from all directions as it were. This experience is known as the great body or the single eye. An American case. Thomas Wolfe, 1978, a computer programmer, remembers how at age 12 he experienced a curious phenomenon that, in retrospect, amounted to a first Kundalini awakening. At the time, he was participating in a rapid calculation contest. As the teacher was reading the first question, Wolfe felt a strange excitement and his body started to vibrate with some inner energy. Then, I noticed a brightness through and about me, a light that had never been so bright before. In a way, the feeling was similar to, but stronger than, the activity one feels in his midsection just before throwing up. But now it was noticeable throughout the whole body and was a good feeling, an alive feeling, rather than a sensation of sickness. No sooner had his teacher finished the arithmetical question than he blurted out the question. He had never before shown any particular aptitude for rapid calculation, and when asked to explain how he arrived at the correct answer so quickly, he was quite unable to do so. He continued to produce the right answers and won that contest, and several others over the next few years. Around the age of 17, this mysterious ability faded. In 1974, when Wolf started to meditate, the Kundalini began to active again. This activity was enhanced through his regular use of biofeedback. Then, at the beginning of February 1975, the following strong Kundalini experience occurred. I had just rolled onto my back and was waiting for the oncoming slumber when I began to see a faintly pulsating light in my mind's eye. Shortly thereafter, an internal query was made somewhere deep within me. It was a question about whether the experience should be permitted to continue. The query was answered almost immediately in the same nearly subliminal manner. The decision was to go ahead, intensify rather than cut off the experience. All of this transpired without words. Immediately the lights intensified and overpowered me. I could no longer quite understand the experience. The intensification was accompanied by many strange, loud sounds, discordant but somehow not unpleasant. These were not quite understandable either. At the same time, I felt a strong current running between the center of my head and my forehead, terminating just above my right eyebrow. This feeling was quite pleasant, almost sexual. After this period of initial confusion, the lights changed drastically. From a non-understandable pattern of random light, they snapped into an understandable fixed holographic pattern of large luminous balls. My body sense, with which myself had associated all my life, had changed into a luminous ball sense, in which the new environment of luminous spheres was my new body. 
This Kundalini awakening was followed by a state of archetypal dreams and psychic experiences, including the ability to transmit of what Wolf calls the satsang effect. The Hindi word satsang, which is derived from Sanskrit satsanga, literally means company of the truth or connection with the real. It generally refers to the traditional practice of sitting in the presence of an awaked or enlightened master. Such sitting in proximity to enlightened adept is universally acknowledged as a means of spiritual awakening. This satsang effect or psychic contagion applies even in the ordinary situations. We all participate in one another's psychic state and is quickly verified when we are in the company of a sick or a depressed person, which tends to drain our energy. Likewise, we are positively affected by being in the presence of a happy individual. It would appear that in the case of a person with an awakened Kundalini, his or her state of being can have a still more remarkable effect on others. Wolf's Kundalini symptoms gradually increased. Then, at the beginning of April, he experienced more classic signs of Kundalini activity. He wrote, I was startled by forceful thrusting and thumping about in my lower back, the Kanda region of classical Kundalini lore. A humorous thought arose that the movement began. It felt like a scroll thumping about to get out. It was like sitting on a living being. Soon my stomach got very hot and I began to sweat. This activity in the lower back continued over the next few days, but the end of the month, a relentless heat, a conflagration, had begun to move slowly over the surface of my entire head. He heard loud noises and pressure built up inside his skull. He continued to see lights, including the blue bindu spot. Next, the Kundalini initiated all kinds of spontaneous bodily movements known as Kriya in Sanskrit. A year later, Wolf was hospitalized. He recollects, I developed a frightening yogic symptom in the mid-1976 that put me in a coronary care unit for three days. This experience was quite similar to the pseudo-heart seizure of Franklin Jones. Dalov Ananda. Later, he developed digestive problems. In early 1977, Wolf cut back on meditation, biofeedback sessions, and after a few months, the unpleasant side effects of Kundalini activity disappeared. When he resumed his meditation practice, he did so from a very different disposition. He no longer hankered after psychic experiences or spiritual visions, realizing that no experience can ever be ultimately fulfilling. He had discovered the truth of self-transcendence. The small self must dissolve, go away. And this is not something one can force or do. It is what remains when one just gives up and surrenders oneself to what will be. Slowly now, the light begins to dawn on me. My search winds down as the light of the day begins to filter through the window. A visionary experience. Flora Courtois 1970, is an American writer and Zen meditator whose enlightenment experience was confirmed by the famous Zen master Yashutani Roshi. Although I know this woman personally, I am placing her in this section because her account is in print. I am citing her case here because it offers a useful contrast to Thomas Wolfe's Kundalini experience as described in the preceding section. In fact, the two accounts are so strikingly different that they afford an inconvenient starting point for discussing the difference between Kundalini arousal and what I propose to call visionary experience. Courtois' first experience of the deepest truth came during a semi-conscious state following a general anesthetic. After undergoing spontaneous unitive experiences in which she seems to fuse with nature, she became preoccupied with how visual perceptions occur. When she wrote on her complex observations, one of her teachers thought she was mentally disturbed and sent her to psychiatrist. This led to a short hospitalization, which upset her greatly. She was so depressed over being misunderstood that she contemplated suicide. 
However, her suicidal thoughts ended one day when the focus of my sight seemed to have changed. It had sharpened to an infinitely small point, which moved ceaselessly in paths totally free of the old accustomed ones, as if flowing from a new source. Courtoise then went in an ecstatic state that lasted for many days. Even though she was immersed in ecstatic bliss, her extraordinary condition in no way interfered with her daily activities. Since then, she has lived in a productive and happy life. Apart from the failure to diagnose her state correctly as a spiritual experience rather than a psychopathological condition, this case is of special interest because she had had few of the symptoms commonly associated with the Kundalini awakening. Her adolescent experiences alone would lead one to anticipate more Kundalini symptoms in her later life. But when she began Zen meditation in 1967, she had instead only one remarkable experience. She was sitting in the meditation hall when she saw a bright light. It seemed so real to her that she assumed the electric lights had actually been switched on. Although she realized she was still in relative darkness, she continued to see brightness for several minutes. We have seen how the visionary experience of light or radiance is a frequent symptom of Kundalini arousal. We can now argue that either Courtois experience was an incomplete Kundalini awakening or it was an experience independent of the Kundalini phenomenon. Gopi Krishna's argument is that all mystical experiences are based on the activation of the Kundalini. Instead, he seems to be saying that the Kundalini underlies all experiences since the Kundalini is the motor that drives the bioenergy of the human system. My own argument is that the physio Kundalini, which is what is being discussed here, is a particular set of experiences that is to be treated as a special case within the vast spectrum of psychic or spiritual experiences. The experiences described by Courtois belong to the non-Kundalini group. Chapter 6. Case Histories This chapter presents 17 case histories of Kundalini arousal. I have personally interviewed 15 of these individuals. The other two were interviewed by a colleague, though I saw one of them briefly as well. Some of these people were referred to me for their physical or psychological problems or because of their difficulties in meditation. Others I sought out after hearing of their unusual experiences. Most of them have become personal friends and have shared their experiences with me in great depth. In all cases, my follow-up inquiries revealed a normalization of the Kundalini process and its integration with the rest of the physical, emotional, and intellectual life of these individuals. Case 1. Male Professor in the Humanities The 69-year-old, who had many psychic experiences as a child, awoke from a nap one day in 1963 to discover a three-inch blister on his thigh where his hands had been resting. This extraordinary experience stimulated his interest in the powers of the mind. Within two years, he was meditating regularly, though without expert guidance. Then, in 1967, he began formal Zen meditation. After a few months, during a sitting, he became engulfed by a bright golden light that lasted several minutes. He had a recurrent experience a few weeks later. During many sittings, he noticed prickling and itching sensations moving up the inside of his legs to his groin, in his arms and in his chest, up his back and over his head to his brows. From there, the sensations moved to his cheeks, the outside of his nostrils and sometimes to his chin. Later, he experienced tingling and itching in his throat during meditation. All these symptoms point to a typical physio kundalini cycle. Today, 10 years later and several years into his retirement, the professor no longer experiences any dramatic manifestations of the Kundalini process. He is, however, 
able to encourage energy flows starting in his pelvis and spreading upwards. These flows, he feels, revitalize him and have even cured him of chronic lower back pain. Occasionally, he feels an energy blockage in his throat, which is the precise location where the Kundalini energy seemed to have been arrested when I first saw him. Nevertheless, he reports many interesting physical changes in recent years. During only mild aerobic exercises, he feels 10 years younger. His shoulders and chest have increased in size by several inches, while his waist was shrunk by as much. He is 15 pounds lighter. His hands still get very hot at times. He hears sounds of bells, and sometimes he is awaked by a loud zing sound. He is leading a quiet life, interrupted only by occasional visits from former students whom he counsels. He is very sensitive to the psychic dimension and frequently has precognitive dreams, usually foretelling events that occur soon after. It would appear that regularity and discipline seem to favor steady progression of the physio-kundalini process and its overall integration with one's psychophysical being. By contrast, a less disciplined, more freewheeling psychic orientation emphasizing trend states, entities, and similar phenomena tends to induce atypical kundalini activity. Case 2. Female high school teacher. This middle-aged teacher of Spanish has been practicing yoga and meditation for many years. In 1980, she started to have a variety of symptoms, such as headaches, tingling in her face and nose, pains and spasms of the throat, cardiac area and abdomen, with popping sensations all over the body. These symptoms became accentuated whenever she would meditate. She also had sensations of emptiness and of her voice not being generated by herself. In November 1985, a dramatic change occurred. In the midst of a 30-day meditation period, she became aware of strong flows of energy washing over her entire body. There was also a loss of sensation, except for sensory perceptions in her head. She felt the kundalini energy pushing and pulling in her face and at the top of her head. There was a bumping, jerking sensation in the chakras of the throat, the heart and the abdomen. These sensations were predictably intensified during the most concentrated meditations. Each area also felt greatly heated up in turn. Then she started to hear machinery-like noises in her head that became continuous over the next few weeks. With her eyes closed, she could see white light streaming from her face and head. These symptoms subsided somewhat after three months but were triggered again after a period of intense meditation and lasted for several weeks. The kundalini energy resumed its flow up the spine and down the face and trunk. She experienced great rapture and ecstatic orgasmic sensations until she began to tire of this hyperstimulation of her nervous system. Shortly afterward, she developed laryngeal spasms, which were accompanied by the fear of choking to death. Then the symptoms returned in full, and for several weeks, she experienced heart attacks. As soon as these symptoms started to subside, she began to suffer from sudden acute sciatica, which was clinically typical and later diagnosed by NMR scan as a ruptured disc pressing on the nerve. After three months of therapy, which did not alleviate her painful condition, she agreed to have surgery. By that time, she had developed pronounced foot drop. There was intense pain extending from her lower back to her left big toe. She suffered from numbness in the sciatic distribution and great stiffness. Then, nearly as dramatically, there was a sudden subsidence of sciatica, and within three days she could walk with only a slight limp. Now, six months later, she only suffers a slight residual weakness on the lower left leg. Her impression was that she must have had some weakness in her back that did not show until the intense kundalini energy became active in that area and precipitated the actual pathology. She looks upon her practically instantaneous healing as a gift of grace. All her symptoms have disappeared even though she continues to meditate. Case 3. Female artist teacher. I first saw this 45-year-old woman 10 years ago. At the time, 
She had been doing automatic paintings for 14 years. For the past two years, she has been creating spontaneous paintings of her inner states, usually foreshadowing imminent experiences. This cycle started when she blacked out during a painting session. When she regained consciousness, she found herself lying on the floor with her body shaking violently and filling with great energy. This condition lasted for about half an hour and recurred the next night. The blast of energy and the trembling returned the following morning while she was doing her yoga practices. It was then that she created her first spontaneous painting. She immediately went on to the second painting in this series. All the while she was experiencing intense waves of energy and inner heat. She was also unaware of who or where she was. She began to worry about going insane. This was followed by free floating anxiety and headaches. Then she worked on her third spontaneous painting while hallucinating patterns of force. It was at that point that she fell apart, depression set in, and she felt like dying. She hurt all over and cried a lot. Painting number four was created. She called it Fractured, because it reflected her inner chaos. Then, over a two-day period, she painted her own face with a snake encircling it. At night, on the day of completion, she awoke trembling all over. She saw a strange reddish being with an elephant face. He put his finger on her forehead. Then she fell asleep again. She dreamt of painting eyes that came alive under her brush. Next morning, she started work on a painting of the blue red man. In a subsequent painting, she depicted that man healing her broken head. A baby was born from that man and then grew up, which was captured in another painting. In another crisis, she did a painting of a red octopus. Then, while in ecstatic state, she created a painting of a head superimposed on a black head. Following this painting, she felt reborn. Her ordeal resumed with painting number 33. Overcome by mood of depression, she felt as if she was imprisoned in a concentration camp, which is reflected in the gloomy scenes of several of her paintings. These spontaneous creations were followed by a painting of an egg with a wavy person emerging. At the end of this series, she felt alive and whole. The next incident was fierce burning in her legs, which then spread into her chest and arms. She suffered hot and cold fevers and was unable to eat. She experienced pain on both sides of her head and behind her eyes, as well as violent palpitations. Her blood pressure was found to be elevated. Just prior to my interview with her, she experienced a cramping pain in her left big toe, as if a nail had been driven through it. My examination revealed a very red toenail, which was not due to bleeding. At this time, she was also unnerved by a complete loss of hearing, which lasted for about an hour, and then she believed she was going to die. She then consulted the physician, who found nothing wrong with her. Since my interview, she has reporting feeling a throat opening sensation, but also breathing difficulties and pressure in the head. These experiences and states seem to be associated with her yoga practice and artistic creativity. Her teaching work seems to exert a stabilizing influence on her and she admitted to feeling generally much better since taking it up. Case 4. Female Psychologist As a child, following a vacation spent in a religiously oriented summer camp, this middle-aged woman experienced feelings of oneness with God and nature for about a year. As an adult, she suffered several episodes of severe depression and was hospitalized during one of these. In 1960 and 1970, respectively, she made two attempts at suicide and was unconscious for days each time. In 1972, she was initiated into transcendental meditation, which helped her bear the tragedy of her daughter's premature death. It also cured her asthma. She practiced this form of meditation for about six months and then did not meditate for a similar period of time. When she resumed her meditation practice, she switched over to the Buddhist technique of Vipassana, watching her breathing, body sensations and thoughts. She gradually increased the time spent in meditation. By the summer of 1974, she was meditating between three and four hours daily. 
It was then that she found her meditations deepening. During one of her sittings, she experienced a strong feeling of disorientation, of not being located in space, which instilled some fear in her. Then, without warning, there was a sudden sharp pain at the base of her left big toe, which was quickly followed by a painful ripping sensation traveling up her leg. Then her lower pelvis and perineum felt as if they were swollen. When this sensation had spread to her waist, her torso suddenly was twisted violently to the right. She would feel the pain in her left big toe whenever a new energy center was opening up further. In her abdomen, she distinctly felt, I must save all sentient beings. This was followed by a cold sensation pouring down over the crown of her head, shoulders and arms into her chest with the accompanying words, I am not ready yet. All this occurred about an hour into her meditation and lasted between 10 and 30 minutes. During an intensive meditation retreat several months later, she again felt her whole body being pushed and pulled by a massive energy. Then she saw a fountain of light erupting from the pelvic area into her head. At the same time, she had a sense that there was a white split in the middle of her body. In 1975, she switched to Tibetan visualization techniques to correct what a Tibetan meditation master had diagnosed as a loop-sided energy flow. She started to experience closing and opening of the energy centers of her body without reason or order. There was also a low-pitched buzzing in her head and throat during meditation and occasionally during the day. She continued to have spontaneous body movements and energy rushes and pains. However, by the end of that year, she was again able to sleep three to four hours every night. She began to see how there was a strong part of herself that was negative towards her own growth and spiritual maturation. But it was not until 1987 that she began to consciously work through the problems of her childhood that had proven formidable obstructions in her psyche. In a recent follow-up interview, she reported her own kundalini headaches are persisting, but the energetic disturbances have gone. She's now experiencing many spiritual connections with living and dead teachers. Psychic phenomena are occurring more frequently, and in particular, she has developed the ability to heal instantly on occasion. Case 5. Male Computer Specialist This man is now in his mid-twenties. At age 9, he suddenly developed shooting pains in his genitals and lower abdomen. When in bed at night, he would feel a strong force pushing its way down his throat. This was accompanied by perceptual distortions. A physician tentatively diagnosed hypoglycemia. In his early teens, he and his friends experimented with hypnosis, and he discovered that he could easily dissociate from the reality. One day, in his 16th year, while sitting quietly, he suddenly started to tremble uncontrollably, and his body became very hot. His abdominal pains returned with full force, accompanied by nausea. After a bowel movement, these symptoms subsided. The next day, again while sitting quietly, he had an out-of-body experience. He had undergone a marginal out-of-body experience state when he was younger. On this occasion, however, he was able to move around the room very easily and to view his resting body very clearly. He became alarmed and by moving his arm was able to slip back into the body. For several weeks after this incident, his world was collapsed and he felt he was going insane. He dissociated many times in school. Later, during the fifth session in a rolfing series in which his psoas muscle was being worked on, he had a strong emotional discharge, with a lot of crying and violent shaking. He felt the immediate need to ground himself. Suddenly, there was a terrific energy, which felt to him like a fire hose that was being forced into his perineum and up his spine. When it reached his head, there was a feeling of infinite space all over him and inside his skull. He also felt a sensation of a hole being bored into his forehead. All the while, there was a display of colored lights around and inside his head. Upon the penetration of the forehead, he felt a great current of air rushing through the opening. This was followed by an infinite peace in infinite space. 
Subsequently, he suffered, as he sees it now, from the delusion that he was enlightened and that this infinite space and outwardly focus were the only truth for him. A Zen master later told him that during that time he had been in a satori state. At age 18, he developed debilitating pains in his solar plexus. These were alleviated whenever he allowed his body to spontaneously assume various postures. Only later did he learn that these were yogic asanas. It was then that he started a program of yogic practices, including breath control, that he still follows every day for at least two hours. He was hoping all this would speed up his regaining the condition of Satori. He also began to read spiritual literature. Five years later, he discovered the writings of Dala Vananda. In the midst of his study of his works, he noticed a remarkable fullness in his abdomen and then his belly felt on fire for hours. To his surprise, he noted that his girth had increased by four inches without any gain in weight. Soon afterward, he became a student of Dala Vananda. He began to realize that his intense yogic practice was born out of the terror of dying in an attempt to remove himself from the stresses of life. He no longer suffered from the delusion of being enlightened and also saw how he had not the slightest inclination towards surrendering the stronghold of the ego, which is the single most important precondition for enlightenment. Then he had his first formal sitting with Dala Vananda. Upon looking at his teacher, who was sitting before hundreds of people, this young man was suddenly possessed by the demonic urge to utterly destroy this being. He found it incredibly difficult to restrain himself from the attempting a violent assault. While he was struggling with his irrational impulse, Dala Vananda made eye contact with him, and he was immediately thrust into his familiar state of blissfulness and infinity. But this time he was not alone. There was a complete merging with the teacher in an enclosure of love. This was the first time he had ever had such an ecstatic experience of being in this space of love and unity with another being. At this moment, the thought arose in him. I can't wait to tell my wife this. That very second, it all stopped. Gradually, he became more open to this new relationship and learned to trust it. But time and again, he would rupture this by claiming credit for his condition. For a period, he became acutely conscious of playing with his energy flows as if he were masturbating with his nervous system. At other times, he would enter into out-of-body states and immediately feel that this too was only an indulgence. He's now dealing with his residual resistances creatively, always reminding himself to return to the naturalness of the spiritual relation with the teacher. Occasionally, his old fears arise, but they are no longer as severe and he is now more capable of allowing them while simultaneously locating with himself the bliss and equanimity that lies beyond fear. Case 6. Female Artists This woman, now in her late 50s, had practiced transcendental meditation for five years when she began to experience occasional tingling in her arms and heat in her hands. Next, she was unable to sleep for days with energy surging through her whole body. She also had several dreams of having her consciousness separated from her body. A continuous loud sound started to appear inside her head. Soon, there were cramps in her big toes, followed by a vibratory sensation in her legs. Overnight, her big toenails darkened as if hit by a hammer and eventually partially separated from the flesh. The tissue in her legs felt torn by vibratory sensations. The vibration spread to her lower back and from there swept over her body up to her head, causing a sensation of a bend around her head, just above the eyebrows. Then her head started to move spontaneously. Later, her whole body would move sinuously and her tongue would automatically press against the roof of her mouth. Both phenomena are all known in yogic circles. The cleaving of the tongue against the palate is counted among the most secret practices of yoga. It bears the technical designation of Keshari Mudra, or the space-walking gesture. 
The space here is the inner space of consciousness. All kinds of psychic powers are attributed to yogins who have mastered this technique. In the case of this woman, the mudra or gesture of inverting the tongue occurred involuntarily. She would also sense a strong sounding of Om, the most sacred syllable in the Hindu tradition, emanating from within her head. The tingling sensations spread to her neck, upward over the head, down to the forehead and face. Both nostrils were stimulated, causing a feeling of elongation of the nose. At times her eyebrows seemed to move separately and the pupils felt like holes that bored into her head and met in the center. Then she felt tremendous pressure at the back of her head, at the crown and across the forehead. This pressure would become especially severe during reading, resulting in acute discomfort around the eyes and in a pulsing sensation at the top of the head. This was followed by experience of a brilliant light and of bliss and laughter. The tingling sensation spread further down to the mouth and chin. It was then that she began to have dreams of heavenly music. Then the sensations traveled to her throat, chest and abdomen, and eventually she felt as if there was a closing of the circuit in the shape of an egg. The energy was moving up through the spine and down through the front of the body. As it developed, the circuit activated particular energy centers on its way. Starting in the lower abdomen and proceeding to the navel, the solar plexus, the heart, the head, and finally the throat. After this closure, she experienced a continuous feeling of energy pouring into her body through the navel area. This feeling stopped after the circuit was completed. The whole experience had strong sexual overtones. It was also accompanied by spontaneous yogic breathing, faint and controlled. The greater part of this Kundalini activity occurred over several months. Subsequently, she experienced only occasional Kundalini phenomena, mostly during meditation or when relaxing in bed. Throughout the protracted experience, this woman understood that she was undergoing a Kundalini awakening since she had read about this phenomenon before. In the beginning, she felt relaxed about what was happening to her and simply allowed the process to unfold as it might but eventually she became perturbed and had difficulty integrating her experiences with her daily activities. The inflow of energy prevented normal sleep for months, and since it continued during the day as well, she found herself incapable of efficient work. She felt herself thrown into the position of a detached observer of her own activities. In due course, she brought the situation under control. This general effect of this Kundalini arousal was positive. There has been steady progress toward a never greater sense of connectedness with what this woman calls herself higher self. A sense of being in touch with an unshakable core, a center that is unaffected by all the ups and downs of everyday life. In my follow-up interview with her, she remarked, From that core comes guidance, peace, and a sense of being in touch with an understanding of the essence of things as they are. It also gives a sense of oneness with all life, and from that comes a love and a joy of existence. Life becomes a path of daily miracles, of harmony, which is expressed in synchronicities and a feeling of trust and security in an unfailing guidance. I feel in touch with myself and the source of all things. She also noted that, with the exception of pressure in the head, all physical sensations have ceased. Case 7. Male Scientist This person, now in his 60s, began transcendental meditation in 1967. After about five years, he suddenly started to have gross thrashing body movements during meditation and at night in bed. After a few weeks, these involuntary movements subsided. Several months later, on going to bed, he felt a tingling sensation in his lower legs, followed by cramping in his big toes. The cramping extended to other muscles before it gradually faded. The tingling sensation spread to his lower back and he saw a reddish light there. The light solidified into a rod, which he then sensed and saw being pushed up his spine. Next, it extended forward to the umbilical area, accompanied by many tingling, vibrating sensations. 
Step by step, it moved up the spine to the level of the heart and then extended forward to stimulate the cardiac plexus. When it reached his head, he saw floods of white light as if his skull were lit up from inside. Then the light seemed to spout out the top of his head as a solid beam. Some time later, he felt a vibration in his right arm and wrist and also in his left leg. As soon as he attended to these sensations, they disappeared. He also experienced energy currents running through his shoulders and arms in waves of three or four per second, later increasing to seven and more per second. At one time, when he focused on the center in his head, violent and uncontrollable spasms occurred. At various times, this Kundalini activity was accompanied by a variety of internal sounds, mostly high-pitched whistling and hissing. At other times, he heard flute-like musical tones. Frequently, he would experience peace and bliss. Then his sleep began to be disturbed again by automatic movements of the body. Sometimes he would awaken to find himself doing spontaneous yogic breathing and assuming a variety of hatha yoga postures. After several nights of this, the tingling sensation traveled to his forehead, nostrils, cheeks, mouth and chin. This whole process was accompanied by ecstatic feelings and he experienced sexual arousal when the activity centered in the pelvic area. Then all these effects ceased, returning only from time to time when he relaxed at night in bed, and he could shut these off by turning on his side. About a year later, pressure developed in his head at night and started to move downward. Simultaneously, a tingling sensation moved upward from his stomach. He experienced all this activity as it from a distance. The two stimuli met at the throat, and then he felt as if a hole appeared where they joined. He further experienced, still from a detached witnessing disposition, all manner of purely spontaneous sounds being emitted from that hole in the throat. Approximately six months later, the stimulus moved down from the throat to the abdomen, where it remained for a few months before moving further down in the pelvic area. The scientist had an inherently sensitive nervous system, yet his awareness that he was undergoing a kundalini arousal and his knowledge of what to expect, together with the stabilizing effect of a meditative discipline, made him less susceptible to the disorganizing aspect of the kundalini cycle. He realized that whatever difficulties he did encounter were the result of over strenuous meditation practice and so he was not beset by anxiety during the process. Case 8. Actress. This woman, now in her early 40s, had many psychic experiences in her childhood. As an adolescent, she suffered from recurring migraines, headaches, mental disorganization and impulsive disruptive behavior. She received psychotherapy for the symptoms for several years, was diagnosed schizophrenic, but was never hospitalized. When she was 24 years old, she began to meditate using various techniques. About a year later, her headaches became worse, but then within a few weeks, her head pains, mental disorganization and disruptive behavior suddenly ceased. Within a year, tingling sensations started in her legs, then spread to her arms and chest. After a few weeks, they extended to her neck and the back of her head and soon down to her forehead. They were more noticeable during meditation. At intervals, her entire body, but especially her hands, would become very hot. During meditation, she was also troubled by swaying and jerking of her body and by anxiety. In fact, she came to my attention because of the severity of her anxiety and the violence of the automatic movements during meditation. I advise her to discontinue her self-styled meditation and take up some established meditative practice. Until this was possible, I suggested that she temporarily decrease her sensitivity to the Kundalini process. Once she was supervised in her practice of transcendental meditation, all disturbing symptoms soon ceased. Some time later, the physio-Kundalini cycle started again. During one long meditation, she became aware of her throat in a new way. She felt as if her head had become separated and floated above her trunk. Her throat started to produce sounds of its own. 
and she became aware of a separate observer self. Most of her Kundalini symptoms ceased after this experience, which was a typical throat opening. Since then, her meditations have been quiet and peaceful. She reports that her productivity and contentment have greatly increased. It is my conjecture that many psychosis-like aspects of her personality were simply due to the fact that she had for so many years failed to find a useful outlet for her psychic energies. In this connection, it is helpful to recall the experience of the British psychic Matthew Manning, 1975, who was plagued by poltergeist phenomena from an early age. They persisted until he discovered that he could do automatic writing. Soon he found that he could paint in the style of several great painters, completing a work in 10 to 20 minutes. Then this turned out to be the most fruitful channel of expression. Once the bulk of his energy could be thus expressed, the poltergeist activities ceased. It may be that in child prodigies it is their very specialization or talent that stabilizes them early in life. They experience fewer conflicts than an individual with a surplus of psychic energy but no appropriate channel for conducting it. Child psychics may have it difficult from the start because of the disturbing and disruptive nature of their genius. Genuine spirituality seldom emerges in as early as other talents. Even such spiritual adepts as Jesus of Nazareth, Gautama the Buddha, the South Indian sage Ramana Maharshi, and the contemporary American master Dalavananda did not enjoy the fullness of their enlightenment until purity or later. Creativity, whether it be of great writer, musician, poet, painter or dancer, does not seem to favor the kind of change in the nervous system that is associated with the kundalini arousal. Perhaps the creative work grounds them more, or possibly there are fewer blocks in the nervous system when genius is narrowly channeled, and so changes in the nervous system may occur without the dramatic signs of the physio-kundalini cycle. I also tentatively suggest that the creative activity of such geniuses may spring from a more subtly functioning area of the nervous system than is indicated by the manifestations of the physio-kundalini. Finally, I wish to suggest that the central nervous system must be relatively mature for the physio-kundalini process to occur at all. Case 9. Female Psychologist In 1973, this woman, then in her 41st year, noted the onset of heat in her head and chest, with tingling sensations over her body and head during meditation. She had been engaged in various intensive group and meditation disciplines for a number of years. Another curious phenomenon occurred during that time. Whenever she would do the tongue and palate exercises she had been taught during a meditative retreat, she would experience orgasm-like waves rippling through her body. She felt hot much of the time, particularly in her chest and throat, yet sensations of coldness were mixed in. She felt shaped like an egg and her whole being felt unified. Vibrations starting in the pelvic area and from there moved up her back to her neck. Her chest felt soft and open. She heard brilliant bird song inside her head and felt a tingling in her throat. Once, a three years earlier, she had felt like a giant heart while meditating. At the time, she experienced a prickling, itching heat all over her body, but she was not troubled because she believed that these sensations indicated successful and centered meditations and a flow between herself and others. She assumed that she was experiencing a kundalini awakening, which she believed to be dangerous unless the higher mind was in control. A few months after the kundalini symptoms started in 1973, she felt during meditation as if she were two feet taller than her normal self and as if her eyes were looking out from above her head. At this time, she was sure that she knew what people were thinking and many of her impressions were confirmed. Soon after this, her feet began to hurt and headaches started. The headaches grew worse whenever she attempted to stop the rippling sensations she was experiencing in her body. She noted that the headaches came when she tried to regulate the rush of energy passing through her. Massage helped the pain in her feet, 
but it was still so severe that she could walk only with difficulty and was unable to drive. She ate very little, her sleep was fitful, and she suffered some nausea. It was hard for her to talk to people. At times, she questioned the reality of her experiences, wondering if they were just a crazy episode. She felt heat on one side of her back and was convinced that unless it spread to both sides, she would be in danger. Once she succeeded in spreading it and this crisis passed. Then a tingling sensation started to move from her pelvis up her back and to her neck. She began to see light inside her skull. She was amazed to find that she could see this light all the way down her spine as well. The energy and tingling moved over her forehead and became focused under her chin. She felt as if there were a hole in the top of her head. Sleep became very difficult for her, and for the next six weeks, meditation was the only thing that helped her. She felt that if she did not meditate, the heat flowing in her body would grow so intense as to damage her system. Other people could feel excessive heat when they touch her lower back. Although she felt strange at times, she was determined to avoid psychiatric help during her trouble, because she feared that she would be labeled and treated as insane. When her symptoms were more than she could bear alone, she worked with various meditation teachers. Then she began to experience rippling sensations and shaking of her body, and she felt as though she was being cleansed and balanced. Shortly afterward, she felt a prickling in her chest and under her chin. Then all unpleasant phenomena ceased, and she had no further difficulty, although she continued her meditation practice. She underwent this physio kundalini cycle in the span of a year. She later started a successful center for personal growth and was able to help others who experienced difficulties in the kundalini process. Her many distressing physical problems were probably due to residual blocks and unresolved conflicts that were locked in her body. These would presumably have not caused her any significant emotional or physical difficulties had her kundalini remained inactive. For the past decade or so, this woman has worked as a therapist. Healing has become an integral part of her practice physically, psychologically and spiritually. During sessions with her patients, she's able to tune in to their feelings, physical condition and personal images. The energetic manifestations have continued almost constantly and they tend to increase when she devotes more time to meditation. As her mind becomes quiet and the silence deepens, there is a heightened awareness and perception. Her whole being begins to vibrate and is charged with the energy of awareness. The vibrations occur horizontally and vertically, and when they are in their most intense, they cause a slight tremor in her hands. Over the years, this state of awareness has increased in intensity and duration. It is accompanied by the sensation of heat in the lumbar area, which rises and spreads to the top of her head. During these periods of inner silence, she is able to perceive a variety of sounds and colors in her body. There is no inner dialogue, but if called upon to speak, there is a great precision of language that is much more directly satisfying than her usual speech. The challenge is to move in and out of the silence with greater ease and fluidity and to be comfortable and confident in various social situations, both professionally and personally. During these sensitive states, which can continue for several days at a time, she experiences openness, freedom, compassion, truth, calmness, joy and love. Case 10. Female Librarian This woman, now in her mid-fifties, had been a meditator in her own style for many years. One day, in 1968, she lost awareness while meditating with her hands on the table. She awoke to find char marks on the table corresponding to her handprints. She had the table refinished before I could examine it. No heat manifestation of this kind ever happened again. Because she did not show a regular progression of symptoms, I regarding her as a possible case of arrested physio kundalini. In 1969, she acquired a psychic guide, which she found very useful in her daily life. Three years later, she became involved in the study of the dreams and drawings of children and even completed an impressive manuscript on this theme. With this newfound interest, the intervention of her guide has ceased. 
Case 11, male writer psychic. This 40-year-old, who is a productive writer and successful wood sculptor, had been meditating for two years when he began to experience heat sensations. During one such episode, he took his oral temperature with an electronic thermometer. It read 101 degrees Fahrenheit, but dropped within a minute or two to 99 degrees. A short time after, his hand temperature was 104 degrees. He was not ill. Around the same time, he started to experience spontaneous trance states. During this, he would receive information psychically, some of which was confirmed. He came to my attention because of his marital difficulties brought on by his trance states. I encouraged him to learn to enter a light trance at will, and his spontaneous trance states stopped. The physical signs of this man were similar to those on the preceding two cases. His personality and orientation were similar to those of the librarian. He made no connections to traditional methods of meditation, though he did study briefly with a curandero healer, not unlike Carlos Castaneda's, Don Juan. He was more attracted to psychic phenomena and powers than to what Carl Gustav Jung called the inner dialogue. This may partially explain his being overpowered by trend states. Jung has repeatedly emphasized that, unless hidden inner drives are somehow dealt with in dreams or in, through some form of inner dialogue, they will manifest obliquely in an autonomous ways that can cause emotional and physical difficulties. Case 12. Male Artist Healer This man, now in his late 30s, remembers his earliest psychic experiences as being lucid dreams in childhood. During one such dream, he saw his double pick up the bedclothes, which had fallen off, and hand them to him. He was frightened by the vividness of the experience. Age 22, he began to practice transcendental meditation. He had many insights and achieved much tension release. But then he made such rapid progress in meditation that, lacking proper guidance, he started to have anxiety attacks during his sittings. Once he had a vision of a white light and lost consciousness. Just preceding this vision, he experienced a flow of energy that started in his abdomen and proceeded to his back, up his neck, and then to the back of his head, where it burst into brilliant light. He also felt heat in his abdomen and head. Subsequently, hissing and roaring sounds occurred during his meditations. As his anxiety grew worse, he shifted to Zen meditation and found some relief. Then he experienced another vision of white light. Next, he went abroad with his family, visiting several psychic healers. He had psychic surgery for lifelong migraine headaches and since then had no recurrences. Members of his family were likewise healed of a number of chronic disorders. He was so impressed with psychic healing that he returned to film one of the healers. Shortly before his return, he began to have precognitive visions. In the end, he decided to apprentice with one of the healers. For two years, he learned all he could about psychic healing and found that he became more and more successful at it. He would experience energy flows and clairvoyantly sense a person's malady, healing friends and acquaintances whenever the opportunity presented itself. His artistic work started to flourish. At first, he was quite unsure of his newly acquired abilities. His old anxiety returned for a while, but subsided when he saw several persons recover from serious illnesses after his healing work with them. Throughout this time, he continued to practice meditation and he would occasionally experience some tingling in his cheeks and along both sides of his nose. Case 13. Male Engineer Healer This former aeronautical engineer, now in his 60s, has been a meditator and healer for many years. In 1973, he suddenly began to have unusual body sensations. He felt pressure in his head, followed by a week of insomnia. Then the pressure changed to vibratory sensation and he felt heat in his body. As the vibration spread from his head to his shoulders and chest and down into his legs, he felt as if his body would explode. When these sensations peaked, the back of his tongue would often develop blisters. 
he experienced waves of colored light pouring through his head and body, and the light would turn golden as it spread. After three weeks of this, he felt washed clean and found that he could control most of the sensations through meditation. He believes that his healing abilities have increased as a result of these experiences, which was confirmed by many inquiries of his clients. These two healers illustrate extreme of self-discipline. Whereas the younger man apprenticed himself to a mature healer, the older man pursued his discipline in a solitary setting. Every night for five years, he would awake early to meditate for two hours. He trained himself to sleep instantly at the end of each session, and he learned to separate his consciousness the moment he lay down. Their approaches were also quite distinct. The younger man used an intuitive method in a setting that fully evoked his instincts. The engineer healer applied a great deal of will and one-pointed effort. I saw this application of will in another case, that of a successful psychic. I tested this man with magnetic stimulation of his right brain using the method described by Bentov in his seminal essay, including in this volume. For some time following the experiment, which involved exposure of the right cerebral hemisphere to a pulsating magnetic field, this person found that he could visualize colors only in the blue-green part of the spectrum, and that his word flow was impaired. The problem with language cleared in a few days, but color visualization took an additional week to be fully restored. He also experienced some stiffness in his neck, which disappeared when the ability to visualize all colors returned. I believe that this man predominantly used his will to achieve psychic effects, showing a dominance of the left cerebral hemisphere. His inherent sensitivity permitted him to respond to the new kind of cerebral activity initiated by the experiment. The new activity on the right brain then came into competition with the usual, well-controlled state in which the left brain was dominant. This may explain the initial left-sided symptoms. The temporary state of confusion lasted until his accustomed homeostasis was re-established. Case 14. Female Secretary This woman had been practicing transcendental meditation for two years when, early in 1975, she began to have tingling and numbness in her lower legs. She was 28 years old at the time. Soon stiffness in one leg began to interfere with walking. She consulted several doctors, including neurologists. When myelographic studies, x-rays of the spine after the injection of radio-opaque oil were suggested, she refused. It occurred to her that her symptoms were worse after days of prolonged meditations, and so she decided to seek advice about the effects of her meditative practice instead. It looked likely that she was in the early stages of physio kundalini cycle and that the stress and worry about possible physical disease were increased her difficulties. I was able to reassure her that her symptoms were part of a normal process in the nervous system that was proceeding too rapidly because of her excessive practice of meditation. Reassurance and temporary cessation of Reassurance and temporary cessation of meditation soon had her on the road to recovery. Later, she resumed her meditative practice in moderation. The physio kundalini cycle continued to unfold without undue side effects. Case 15. Housewife. This woman, now in her late 30s, began transcendental meditation in the mid-70s. She quickly developed tingling and occasional stocking-type numbness in her left foot and leg. When her mother-in-law moved into the house with her and her husband, the symptoms grew worse. She got a stiff leg and developed foot drop. She went for medical help and a myelogram was done. Subsequently, the symptoms increased and she was put on cortisone. She was told by her neurologist that she might never recover full use of her leg. This severely depressed her, and she became almost non-functional. It was at this time that she came to my attention. This woman had an extraordinarily sensitive nervous system, 
and was clearly in the early stages of the physio-kundalini cycle. Her worry about the prognosis and the effect of the cortisone treatment had led to pain and stiffness in her back and legs. Once her symptoms were correctly identified as resulting from an awakened kundalini, her full recovery was guaranteed. Today, with 10 more years of experience with similar cases, I would say that some slight residual impairment of function is not unusual. Case 16, housewife. In 1972, this woman, who was then in her mid-50s, experienced the onset of an intense and disturbing process. She suddenly felt that something was descending over her head. Indira Devi described in almost identical words this experience, which happened during her first meditation and which was soon followed by a spontaneous kundalini awakening. In the case of our woman, this feeling or sensation was followed by a fainting spell. This pattern recurred several times. Remarkably, she was never groggy after regaining awareness, as might be expected with a convulsing disorder. Physicians were unable to give her any relief. Then, one time, she heard a voice saying inside her head, Are you ready? Later, she heard internal music. One day, she was feeling well until late in the afternoon when the base of her left big toe started to ache. Soon, the pain extended up her shin and she would feel the workings on her knee joint. The pain was intermittent but disabling. She spent a few days in bed where she spontaneously assumed many yogic poses. Several days later, her body felt worked on from the toes up the back in segments. This process was accompanied by pain on both sides of her nose and by waves of energy and tingling sensations up her neck and down her face. There was also the sensation of intense heat in her back and she experienced severe vice-like pressure around her head. During some of these energy flows, she was forced to breathe in a sighing manner. Occasionally, there were torsional whipping movements of her head and neck and once the energy moved down into her head, causing her scalp to get cold and her face to get hot. Over a period of about three years, she slowly became convinced that she had been selected by God to be born anew as an advanced human being. Thus she yielded to the tendency that Jung had warned against, that of claiming this impersonal force as her own ego creation and as a result of falling into the trap of ego inflation and false superiority. She expected others to understand exactly what she was speaking about and to accept her word unquestionably and she grew distrustful of anyone who disagreed with her interpretations. This woman had never submitted to the discipline of regular meditation and was also not interested in any help I had to offer. Case 17. Male Psychiatrist This colleague of mine, now in his early 40s, had been meditating regularly for three years and also had served as a subject in our research with the magnetic stimulator when in 1975 he experienced a kundalini awakening. It's worth noting that he was born with a spinal defect for which he had surgery that left him with chronic lower back pain since his teens. In December 1975, this psychiatrist attended a weekend at the school of a Swami in Oakland, California. Upon being touched by the Swami, he went into deep meditation. Within 10 minutes, his mouth automatically opened widely and his tongue protruded. After a few minutes, he experienced a blissful calm and many inner visions, in which the Swami appeared to him and helped him experience a fusion with the Guru. A few minutes later, he saw the interior of his abdomen, chest and throat light up with a golden energy. Then his lower back began to ache severely. At the onset of the pain, a white light in his head became more and more intense. The back pain disappeared towards the end of the meditation and did not return. Following this remarkable experience, his meditations at home became very productive. Emotional problems and unfinished incidents seemed to find solutions very rapidly and at great depth during his meditations. Then, in the middle of January 1976, he developed a rash that formed a curved line. It began at his lower back, 
crossed his spine twice and veered off to his left shoulder. He was wondering whether it might have a symbolic significance, rather like the stigmata of some Christian mystics. At about this time, he also noticed a return of the high-pitched sounds and scratching noises during meditation that he had experienced earlier after being stimulated many times over a period of several months with the magnetic device. In January, he participated in a second weekend intensive during which he was again touched by the Swami. Immediately, he felt painful tingling and hot and cold sensations spreading over his upper back and neck. His throat burned and there were automatic movements of head and neck. Then he felt inner peace and blissfulness. Later, his head started to spin and he felt vibrations in his hands. Next, his knees began to burn and he felt a buzzing up his spine that ended in feelings of light and energy in his head. Throughout these experiences, his breathing was irregular, at times rapid and shallow, at other times slow and deep. Everything seems to be breaking loose inside him and he felt as though he were in labor. Toward the end of this meditation, he experienced great inner peace and a deep knowing of his inmost self, followed by a total sense of freedom and of coming home. The next day, he had difficulty returning to his usual state. He was uncoordinated and unable to concentrate. For several days, he felt physically exhausted. His meditation, however, continued to deepen. Then, for a few days, he experienced intense pain in his left big toe and left foot, which spread to his lower leg. He also had a ache on the left side of the back of his head. The pain extended to his left eye, which would occasionally close automatically. After a few days, this intermittent pain disappeared. The pain in his leg, which had resisted all treatment, cleared at about the same time. In his day-to-day -day life, family and friends experienced him as more relaxed. A physical therapist whom he saw regularly confirmed that my friend felt more relaxed and integrated since this Kundalini awakening. His sense of having come home grew into a feeling at oneness with the world. Then, during meditation, itching developed on his forehead and occasionally on his cheeks, indicating a further progression of the physio Kundalini cycle. Towards the end of 1976, he visited the Swami Hermitage in Ganesh Puri, India. He meditated three times a day for a total of four hours. Another two to three hours were spent chanting. During most of his meditations, he experienced ecstatic love bliss and he would frequently merge into the blue light of consciousness. This intense spiritual discipline stimulated the Kundalini energy in the region of the first and second chakras. As a result, he experienced powerful surges of energy that sent his urogenital system into orgiastic spasms. He felt his semen flow upwards through the body's central channel, traditionally known as Sushumna Nadi. He later understood that this experience was associated with the piercing of the first knot. He spontaneously entered a period of complete celibacy. He witnessed the baby toenails on both his feet fall off the same night. After his return from India, he spent several years integrating his spiritual experiences with the practicalities of daily life, achieving a rare attunement and balance. Other meditative experiences followed, indicating the piercing of the second knot. During one of his evening meditations, back again at the Ganesh Puri Ashram, the Kundalini energy became intensely focused in the subtle center between the eyebrows. The Swami spontaneously walked over to him and immediately began to work his fingers over the space between the six and the center at the crown of the head. Streams of Kundalini energy started to flow in a V-shaped pattern towards the crown center. Since that time, he reports, the Kundalini energy has rarely left the crown center. Discussion The Physio-Kundalini complex has a number of characteristic features, both objective and subjective. The typical physio-kundalini progression, as outlined, rarely occurs in practice, but often several of the effects do manifest. If we accept the view that these effects are the results of the balancing action of the kundalini as it removes blockages throughout the system, then individual differences in symptom patterns mean that different areas are blocked. 
This may be due to dissimilarities in the genetic makeup and the past history of each individual. Also, the varying time involved in the unfolding of the physiokundalini cycle, lasting from a few months to several years, may be caused by variation in the intensity of a person's meditation practice and by the total amount of balancing needed. Often the cycle does not run its full course, as already noted. This arrest of the physiokundalini cycle may occur in those who become fascinated with some particular psychic ability. Furthermore, the signs and symptoms are not present continuously, but appear at intervals, most often during meditation, quiet time or sleep. Chapter 7. Self-Reports. Female Artist Writer. This highly creative woman, now in her mid-40s, lives a very productive life and has a strong desire to integrate all aspects of her life. Her Kundalini activity has thus far consisted chiefly of visionary and auditory experiences, though she has also encountered other typical Kundalini phenomena. The following is a summary description of her Kundalini experience in her own words. In the spring of 1966, I was awakened with a such quantum leap of subtle energy in my body that I was unable to sleep for over two months. During the following six months, sleep continued to be difficult for me. At the inception of the awakening, I saw a vision of the whole earth and heard a voice saying, learn the deep archetypes of humanity. It took me some time before I could really learn, study or do anything because my whole being was opening up into realms wholly new to me. I walked and studied at night and performed my earthly tasks of being a mother and housewife during the day. I knew nothing about the Kundalini at the time. It was others who subsequently recognized what was happening to me as a Kundalini awakening. My experience was sudden, unexpected and undeniable. It wasn't easy, all the more so since no one around me knew of such things. Though the power of the experience was not easy to endure, I often felt expanded, joyful and extremely nourished spiritually, especially when I was alone. In 1963, I had started Zen meditation and I believe it was largely my meditation practice that led to the awakening. It has also been Zen and Vipassana meditation that have helped me to integrate the Kundalini experience. Access to this energy is the greatest wealth of my life. Yet, like all wealth, it is not always easy to manage. At times, I have felt tingling energy all over my body. Sometimes I experienced it as pain, at other times as ecstasy, bliss, extreme happiness and insight. I learned that resistance led to pain, whereas acceptance led to bliss. Gradually, I learned to respond rightly. During the first two months, I came to believe that I would never sleep again. At first, this was completely unacceptable to me, but eventually I came to terms with it. Although I accepted the unacceptable, I still had no orientation, no forms or modes of life for this quantum leap in energy level. It seemed beyond my capacity. I was experiencing light in subtle realms simultaneously with ordinary sensory perception. This was very disorienting and I sought out maps for this new territory. This was the call to learn the archetypes of humanity. Eventually, I began to find my questions mirrored in world myths, sacred art, religions, and mysticism, which I studied at night. The intensity of my study and quest lasted eight years. Then I finally felt that the sudden awakening of 1966 had become integrated with the rest of my life. Since then, I have felt that the increase of subtle energy has been in smaller increments such that I could master it more easily, especially through meditation practice. The spiritual cosmologies in myths, religion and sacred art provided some clues about universal laws that included the supersensible realms to which I had acquired access. My quest has never stopped, but in the meantime, I have discovered some holistic patterns of the archetypes. This holistic orientation is, in my view, the foundation for a new life and culture. 
I feel that the Kundalini experience is not simply physiological or psychological, but also cosmological and spiritual. In my case, it is a response to a spiritual call that demands cosmopsychological answers. Insight into the cosmic order is synchronous with insight into the deepest levels of human nature. The Kundalini energy has the voltage or charge that propelled me into realms that go far beyond my sensory awareness. Over the years, these super sensible realms have become the nourishment and guidance of my life. In 1976, I again experienced a quantum leap in energy and received a vision that has been a directive in my life ever since. This vision was in regard to a universal language. At first, in my meditation, there appeared a point of intense, unearthly, beautiful blue light. Then the blue light enveloped me and I went into a realm where I saw three immortal beings more clearly and purely than is possible in sensory perception. The central being was white and on the either side were immortals in red and blue. An elixir dropped from the roof of my mouth, from my brain, and pervaded my body with bliss. I saw celestial landscapes and the immortals showed me the luminous structure behind nature. I was granted a vision of the future of our planet. I was told there would be human travail, but that there would also be children who will understand the universal language that I was shown. Such visions and voices are not mere hallucinations. In my understanding, the difference between visions and hallucinations lies in the fact that visions are clear directives of life, the test of which is whether they become manifest in a positive way in one's life. Hallucinations are the same psychological function, but manifest in persons who have not integrated this primal energy. It blows them apart instead. In 1984, I experienced another quantum increase of subtle energy, accompanied by visions and voices. At that time, I saw people's chakras, auras, and many spirit beings. I learned certain shamanic techniques to work with this energy so that I could access the subtle realms and see visions and hear voices at will. It has taken me two years, however, to learn not to be caught up in the ecstasy of the energy and to ground, deepen, and integrate it. In 1986, I fell ill because of an imbalance of the spiritual energy, which was burning me up. During the illness, I realized that if I did not learn to master the subtle energy, I would live at most only five more years. Since I feel I cannot fulfill my destiny in that span of time, I am consciously working on rebuilding my physical body to sustain the increasing subtle energy. Male Psychiatrist this middle-aged man is a practicing Jungian analyst in whom the Kundalini process was triggered through bodywork. Here is his account of his encounter with this great force. Following medical school in the late 1950s, I embarked upon a psychiatric career that was first channeled through a conservative, mostly Phrygian residency. Next followed six years of personal psychoanalysis, during this time I accepted reductive interpretations of numerous religious dreams as well as what I later discovered to be bona fide telepathic dreams, which intruded into my analyst's personal life. His later dreams created some unsettling moments in this overly rational analysis. During the final year of this analysis, Carl Gustav Jung began appearing in my dreams, and I soon discovered this three-dimensional view of the psyche. Once solidly engaged in my personal Jungian analysis, and in training as a candidate at the local Jungian Institute, my dreams began beckoning me to explore the realm of body awareness. My entrance into this work was accompanied by great skepticism. I had shown readings and discussions in this area, still influenced by the dogmatic pronouncement of one of my professors that Wilhelm Reich's writing on the armoring of the body occurred during this psychotic phase. I was very wary. Yoga and other Eastern practices and philosophies were likewise suspect to me, and I had never paid any serious attention to them. Utter surprise overtook me about six months into this body work, which consisted in deep breathing and extremely slow movements of small segments of the body, when the areas around my eyes started to convulse like activities. After each bout of this automatic muscular activity, 
I experienced a gentle vibratory sensation that grew more intense and pleasurable as time passed. Gradually, section after section of my body underwent similar movements, with the throat area being the last affected. The pleasurable vibrating sensations gradually increased and it took time to develop my tolerance for this pleasure. But there were also painful experiences. For several months, intense heat radiated from my abdomen, making it too uncomfortable for my partner to sleep close to me. When the vibrations began entering my head, I suffered three months of headaches and fears that I would become psychotic. Over the course of seven years, these totally autonomous vibrations gradually came under the control of my ego. Presently, I can tune in to the vibrations simply by closing my eyes and by directing the energy into any energy center or chakra desired. Numerous benefits have accrued through this long process. I am able to experience total bodily pleasure, which is in fact a meditation experience. I can free myself from stress almost immediately, distract myself from physical pain, and recharge my energy supply when depleted. In the beginning, when the energy in my head provided me with a wonderful high, I would overindulge and find myself with a hangover effect the next day. Greed in this area also extracts a price, a refractory period of dysphoria. My dreams often gave me directions in how to use the energy and they also warned me about dangerous pitfalls ahead. I was fortunate to be in analysis with an analyst who understood this process and the symbolic dream material. During some of these periods of intense energy activity, several patients reported similar activities in their own bodies in my presence. Reflecting on the 12 years since my first experience of this inner energy, I feel I have been blessed to have experienced the unfolding and constant refinement of the Kundalini force in my life. In the most uncanny ways, I find myself attracted to strangers who, I discover afterwards, have undergone profound body awareness work that has opened them up to a deeper spiritual awakening and a more meaningful life. I have the sense that this process is ongoing and I await further developments. Female healthcare professional. The single woman who is now in her mid 30s triggered the Kundalini in 1970 by taking LSD. At the time, she had no understanding of what was happening to her, and the symptoms associated with the Kundalini arousal greatly disturbed her. In March 1981, after reading the first edition of my book, she wrote to me in some detail about her history with this phenomenon. The following is an edited version of her articulate account. My experience with Kundalini was and perhaps still is the most impactive event of my life. For years, I read anything I could to get my hands on that might be related to my strange and at times terrifying experiences. After 11 years, it is really satisfying to find your book, which synthesizes the various aspects of Kundalini in a way that echoes my own conclusions. In 1970, at age of 18, I took three trips on LSD. The first two trips were beautiful and spiritual. During the second, I experienced what was probably a form of Satori. During the third, I experienced what I now call Kundalini. Preceding the Kundalini was an awareness of my capacity to turn off my mind and self, to annihilate my individuality without physical death. Right now, this is meaningless to me, but it was my experience. Shortly thereafter, I felt a rush, a war of white light shot from the base of my spine through and out of the top of my head. I was terrified, panicked, and I thought I was dying. I yanked down the rush of light energy. It occurred again and again with seconds or minutes in between. I kept yanking it down. I went to an emergency room and was given Thorazine. I saw a psychiatrist for six weeks. It was not very helpful, but served me as anchor in my confusion. The roar and rush of white light continued. We call this LSD flashbacks. At first, it occurred several times a day. At times, I would jump up from a sound sleep with the white roar. During this time, I was mostly preoccupied with the certainty that I was either dying or going crazy. I was not particularly interested in the experience itself, only in stopping it. After six months of anxiety, palpitations, weight loss and diarrhea, I went into the hospital, medical, not psychiatric, for a week of tests and rest and recuperation. 
The first night I was there, I closed my eyes to go to sleep and felt a light touch between my eyebrows and felt that things would now get better. I recall that during my stay, I sometimes played with my hands, forming what I now know as mudras, spontaneous gestures. I also remember playing at reading palms and getting tired of all the nurses who dropped in because they had heard I did this. Maybe I was good at it, I don't remember. I started writing poetry around this time. The only piece I ever submitted was accepted for publication. My sketching also improved. The next two years were difficult, even though I became more adept at controlling the energy rushes. I learned to stop the rushes at the base of my skull. At times, my head and neck would shake from the effort of holding back the energy. I didn't always feel in sync with my body. Often, my body was in slightly different position from the one I subjectively experienced. Around the age of 20 to 22, I had a number of trivial psychic experiences. All were witnessed. Several involved dreams predicting certain pieces of mail I received. One involved a very minor auto accident. In a dream of baptism, I experienced light, love, joy streaming gently through my body toward the sky. My sexual dreams became more real and in some I would experience orgasms. Between my 22nd and my 25th year, the rushes were not so intense. I could control them at the base of my skull. I experienced shaking and vibrating, visible, which, if intensified, became a rush. Measurable heat usually accompanied the vibrations, 99 to 101 degrees. During this period, I spent a year and a half in group therapy. I knew exactly what I needed to do there. The only resistance I had was conscious holding back. I had a flow of energy that I was consciously blocking and now I had a safe and supporting place in which to gradually open the valve. For the first few months, I did very little other than allow my body to vibrate, loosen the clamp on the energy, cry, etc. I understood by now the relationship of the Kundalini energy to psychological blocks, and I appreciate your corroboration in this more than anything. During therapy, my neck block dissolved undramatically and was expressed in increased spontaneity. Also during therapy, I felt for the first time the very fine vibrations of the nose and mouth area, and also the experience of sweetness through my entire body. I had many special dreams during this period of flying, of illuminated landscapes, and of being filled with energy. Some of these dreams were almost overwhelming, but always they were positive. From the age of 25 to 27, I no longer experienced fear regarding my Kundalini energy experiences. When I felt the beginnings of shaking and vibrating, I would go to where I could be alone. I sometimes put my body into positions it wanted to assume. I allowed myself to breathe however my body wanted, often deep and fast. Sometimes I made sounds. These things were for me neither voluntary nor involuntary, but allowed. Sometimes I felt sexual, sometimes in my chest or my nose and mouth would vibrate. Sometimes my abdominal muscles would roll or contract. Sometimes I heard a high-pitched ringing or a low roar in my ears. I began meditating in my own style. I would relax and allow cause a certain feeling to saturate my body. I realized since reading your book that the feeling spreads approximately in the order you mentioned, always beginning with the feet. The feeling is a sweet porous emptiness and is not just on the surface. The switch makes my body feel as if it were all one substance energy. Then something happens in my eyes. There's a pressure in my eyes directed to a point behind and between them. Then sometimes something switches there and I experience a vast dark clearness and I am a point in it. Occasionally somewhere along the line my body feels like it is floating and moving. During the last couple of years I have been frightened only once. I felt as if my subjective energy self were growing bigger and bigger, around 18 feet, and I was afraid that I would vanish. The vibrating has occurred only twice that I recall, both times in consciousness expanding situations. I welcome the vibrating and go along with it, and the result is increased joy while it lasts, a kind of grounded ecstasy and openness. I am sure that I could induce the vibrating by setting up the necessary conditions. 
The floating feelings during meditation have increased and are exactly the same feeling as flying in dreams. One morning in bed, before waking, I realized that I would have to move in a few more inches before I could wake up, before I was not quite in sync with my body. So I moved in and promptly woke up. This was not a thought, but an experience of my senses. Another new thing that has happened a few times is that I will be asleep, but completely conscious. I don't know how else to describe it. I am not talking about lucid dreaming, which I also have, as I can see with my eyes closed. I just lie there in bed and look around the room with my eyes closed and see in incredible detail. This is very unlike dreams. It is exactly like vision. I recently had a physical sensation dream of merging. The word for it was given in the dream. I merged with another person. First the porous, empty, sweet feeling occurred. Then our trunks merged. Then we had to pull our straying arms into sync. I am telling you about these dreams because I know that there are the further workings of the Kundalini. It is the same energy becoming more and more refined. And it is the same whether I am waking or sleeping or meditating. Now, six years after this letter, this woman is no longer meditating. The Kundalini activity has quieted down. Her interests lie mainly in the external world. She feels shut down in the navel and heart centers. Though she is having frequent psychic experiences, particularly precognition and lucid dreaming. Chapter 8. Summary of Signs and Symptoms In understanding the physio-kundalini complex, it is useful to distinguish between signs, objective indications and symptoms, subjective descriptions, and to arrange these into four basic categories, motor, sensory, interpretive, and non-physiological phenomena. Point 1. Motor. Any manifestation that can be independently observed and measured. Point 2. Sensory. Inner sensations such as lights, sound, and experiences normal classed as sensations. Point three, interpretive, any mental process that interprets experience. And point four, non-physiological, phenomena that, taken at face value as genuine occurrences, must involve factors for which physiological explanations are not sufficient. This fourfold classification is a convenient device in reality, the physio-kundalini effects, such as automatic body movements, tingling, inner light, are often merely different aspects of a single integrated experience. Another difficulty is that some phenomena belong to two or three categories at once. For instance, objective heat manifestation falls under the motor and sensory categories, whereas single seeing is both sensory and interpretive. In this case, I have listed the experience under each of the applicable headings for ease of reference, though it is discussed only once. Motor phenomena. Automatic body movements and postures. The movements, known in yogic terminologies as kriyas, actions, are spontaneous, although the person may be able to inhibit their occurrence. They can affect any part of the body, including the eyes. Movements may be smooth and sinuous, spasmodic and jerky, or vibratory. They range from muscle twitching to prolonged trembling to the automatic assumption of otherwise difficult and maybe even impossible yogic postures, asanas, mudras, etc. A person may assume these postures without prior knowledge of these yogic practices, which may contain a clue about the way in which they were discovered originally. These automatic movements also include spontaneous crying, laughing, screaming, and whistling. Unusual breathing patterns. According to yogic theory, the life force prana pervades the entire body and the world at large. Prana is closely associated with the breath, which is the mechanism by which the life force enters, circulates in, and then leaves the body. The yogin, especially the practitioner of Hatha Yoga, aspires to control the flow of the breath, life force in order to harmonize his bodily energies and increase his vitality. This is thought to prepare the body 
for the onslaught of the spiritual process, notably the Kundalini awakening, which, as we have seen, can have all kinds of undesirable purificatory side effects. The yogic manipulation of the life force is technically known as pranayama, which is composed of the words prana, literally life, and ayama, meaning extension, lengthening. This term is often translated as breath control, which is adequate enough, providing we remember that the breath is the carrier of the life force. Some yogins spend many hours a day practicing a variety of pranayama techniques, which typically involve prolonged breath retention. The automaticities that can occur in the physio-kundalini cycle also include uncommon breathing patterns, such as rapid breathing, shallow breathing, deep breathing, or extended breath retention. As with all the other kriyas, these spontaneous alterations of a person's customary breathing pattern can cause a great deal of anxiety. But according to advanced yogins, these occurrences are more or less a regular feature of the kundalini process. However, some of these authorities warn against the use of pranayama as a means of accelerating the kundalini's ascent. Paralysis. During deep meditation, the body sometimes becomes temporarily locked into certain postures. The partial paralysis of the two young women whose cases I discussed in chapter 6 must be considered unusual. Their disabilities develop gradually and remain over long periods of time and also interfered with her normal functioning. In both instances, the paralysis subsided when I was able to alleviate their intense fear of the Kundalini process through explanation, emotional support, and encouragement. It seems likely that their paralysis was a secondary symptom rather than a primary effect of the physio-Kundalini cycle, the change from an underlying organic weakness to a manifest symptom produced by the assault of the Kundalini energy. Sensory phenomena, tickling sensations. The skin or the inside of the body may tingle, tickle, itch or vibrate. Apt descriptions are as deep ecstatic tickle and orgasmic feelings. The sensations often start in the feet and legs or the pelvis and move up the back to the neck and the crown of the head and then down to the forehead, the face, the throat and the abdomen where they terminate. The progression is seldom disordered, but when it is, we can consider it as a typical physio-kundalini cycle. Heat and cold sensations. Sensations of temperature extremes affecting either the whole body of, or parts of it occur typically in the kundalini cycle. Like the tingling or tickling sensation, they may also move through the body on occasion, but not always in any recognizable pattern. The sensations of heat and cold may have objective manifestations, which, as we have seen, can include paranormal phenomena. Inner lights and visions. A variety of autistic light experiences may occur during the physio-kundalini process. Some traditions even outline whole sequences of such light phenomena. Foreign visions of varying complexity may also occur, though they are rarer. I have already spoken of the importance of autistic experiences in the mystical or spiritual traditions of the world. Visions of light were a part of most of the physio-kundalini cases that I was able to study. Psychiatrist Richard Buke, author of the widely read book Cosmic Consciousness, considers this to be the most important criterion for determining whether an experience is cosmic or not. He envisions a whole spectrum of light experiences ranging from subjective symptoms to objective sign. The most subtle experiences are, according to him, those in which illumination is simply a new way of grasping something, as in the aha experience. Then there are visions of internal lights or lights. Further along in the spectrum are cases in which the experience of inner light is accompanied by the ability to see a darkened room as illuminated. Still more objective or externalized are cases in which others perceive an aura or halo of light around the illuminated mystic or enlightened being. Inner sounds. Internally perceived sounds include a variety of characteristic noises, such as whistling, hissing, chirping, roaring, and flute-like sounds. These tonal experiences were reported by most of the cases I had occasion to study. They seem to vary somewhat in accordance with the type of meditation practice. 
The yogic literature, especially the Sanskrit texts on Hatha Yoga, contain numerous references to this phenomenon, and some even offer a formal arrangement of such sounds, proceeding from the gross to the subtle and ending in the transcendental sound called Nada. This mystical sound is also known as the sacred syllable Om. Pain. Some of the effects of the Kundalini event are as obvious to subject as running into a wall. Pain is one of these. Painful sensations are often reported in the head, the eyes, the spine, and other parts of the body. These may begin abruptly, without apparent cause, only to vanish as abruptly and mysteriously after a period of time, from a few seconds to hours and days. The experience described in chapter 6 of the female psychologist who discovered that her headaches were caused by her attempt to control the physio-kundalini process suggests that pain during the physio-kundalini cycle might be caused by conscious or subconscious resistance to the process. The case of the actress suggests that pain might also occur when the flow of the kundalini force encounters a blockage in the body. This interpretation can explain, for instance, the vice-like headaches associated with the kundalini awakening. Itzhak Bentov has addressed this issue in an interview with the New Age magazine in March 1978. Building on Bentov's speculations, Mineda J. McCleave, 1978, has dedicated a whole article entitled Kundalini Headaches and Biofeedback to this matter. Perhaps it is true to say that some of the 40 million Americans who are suffering from periodic tension headaches, a good many may be experiencing unpleasant side effects of a partial Kundalini arousal. McCleave made the following observations. Tension headaches may be unrecognized symptoms of Kundalini awakening in a nation that has no understanding of the process, but is learning by experience what happens without knowledge why it happens. Migraine may be a precursor to Kundalini activity or an associated ailment. Cluster headaches, a form of particular harsh headache, can generally strike males by me explained by the cycling nature of the Kundalini. These headaches tend to strike most often in the spring and the fall, and though many theories are put forth, no one knows with any uncertainty why they are seasonal. Such headaches may last for half an hour to two hours approximately and then disappear for a short while, only to return several times daily, with pain severe enough to cause the victim to pace the floor in agony. They may occur in such clusters for weeks or months, and then completely disappear until the next cluster season. It is suspected that some kind of biorhythmic chemistry may be involved. Kundalini research may help to provide the answer to this mystery. Interpretative phenomena Unusual or extreme emotion During the physio-kundalini cycle, feelings of ecstasy, bliss, peace, love, devotion, joy, and cosmic harmony may occur almost as readily as feelings of intense fear, anxiety, confusion, depression, and even hatred. In general, especially in the early stages of the process, any of the normal emotions may be experienced with much greater intensity than usual. In the later stages, feelings of bliss, peace, love, and contentment tend to predominate. Distortions of thought processes Thinking may be speeded up, slowed down, or altogether inhibited. Thoughts may seem off balance, strange, or irrational. The person may feel on the brink of insanity, enter complete trance states, or may become impulsive and feel alienated and generally confused. Most of the cases I studied involve changes of this type at some stage of the process. Roger Walsh's personal confession about meditating and thinking is pertinent here. Recalling a 10-day retreat during which he was expected to practice mindfulness, the Buddhist Vipassana meditation, 18 hours a day, he wrote, Subtlety, complexity, infinite range and number, and entrapping power of the fantasies which the mind creates seem impossible to comprehend, to differentiate from reality while in them, and even more so to describe to who has not experienced them. The power and pervasiveness of these inner dialogues and fantasies left me amazed that we could be so unaware of them during our normal waking life. 
Walsh further described how he countered much anxiety and once that freewheeling anxiety had subsided, he felt greatly and unreasonably agitated at the fact that his inexplicable fears had vanished. The Kundalini process, like deep meditation, stirs up the sediments of the unconscious and comforts a person with just those psychic materials he or she wishes to inspect least of all. Apart from being unpleasant, this process also holds a certain risk for more unstable individuals. Detachment. The individual undergoing the physio-kundalini process may feel that he or she is observing from a distance his or her own thoughts, feelings, and sensations. This witnessing consciousness differs from mere aloofness or anxious withdrawal inasmuch the observer self experiences itself in opposition to the observed mental activities. This condition is hinted at, for instance, in the Sufi expression, the fire of separation, and in the concept of the seer of the yoga of Patanjali. This condition does not commonly interfere with the individual's normal functioning. Dissociation. The state of detachment or the witnessing consciousness is attained through the withdrawal of the self from identification or active involvement with its associated mental processes. This detached disposition can be in balance when deep psychological resistances, fear, confusion, or social and other environmental pressures are present. In that case, the disposition of detachment may be accompanied by or result in hysteria or a state akin to schizophrenia. Also, the person may become egotistically identified with the physio-kundalini process leading, for instance, to the delusion that he or she has been divinely chosen for some great mission. Imbalances of this kind can usually be overcome in time and through a supportive environment. Single seeing. This phenomenon can be easily identified as a distinct state by the typical and graphic metaphors used by those who have had this experience. The artist, whose case are related in chapter 6, reported that her eyes seemed to move separately and the pupils felt like holes which bored into my head and met in the center. Flora Courtois, 1970, a modern mystic, wrote of her own experience thus. My sight has changed, sharpened to an infinitely spawn point, which moves ceaselessly in paths totally free of the old accustomed ones, as if flowing from a new source. It was as if some inner eye, some ancient center of awareness, which extended equally and at once in all directions without limits, and which had been there all along, had been restored. This inner vision seemed to be focused on infinity in a way that was detached from immediate sight and yet had a profound effect on sight. This remarkable phenomenon of single seeing is further elucidated by an observation by Carl Gustav Jung in his 1932 seminar on the Kundalini. Asked whether it was not Wutan who lost one eye, he agreed, adding that Osiris did also. Then he went on to say, Wotan has to sacrifice his one eye to the well of Mimir, the well of wisdom, which is the unconscious. You see, one eye will remain in the depths or turn towards it. Therefore, Jacob Bohem, when he was enchanted into the center of nature, as he says, wrote his book about the reversed eye, one of his eyes was turned inward, it kept on looking into the underworld, which amounts to the loss of one eye, he had no longer two eyes for this world. Perhaps this is the meaning, or at least part of it, that we must assign to the well-known biblical saying found in Luke 11.34, The light of the body is the eye, therefore when thine eye is single, thy whole body is also full of light. This is the text according to the King James Version. In a more recent edition of the Bible, the word single has been changed to sound, which is an exoteric reinterpretation of an essentially esoteric experience. One is also reminded of the single eye of the Cyclops in Greek mythology. Here, the British classicist E.A.S. Butterworth, 1970, has the following insightful comments. I know of no possible explanation of the eye in the forehead of the Cyclops as it is not the Ajna Chakra of a form of yoga. Odysseus, as I suggest, is grinding out the third eye, shows in our Odyssey his antagonism to any such view of man. 
The third eye is iconographically depicted as located in the middle of the forehead. But as Dalo Vananda has made it clear, its true location is in the brain core itself. Alice Green, 1975, interestingly reported that some of her biofeedback subjects saw an inner vision of a single eye confronting them while they were deeply relaxed. Perhaps we can see in this a symbolic representation of the third eye. Single seeing has thus many aspects, when in the present context it is understood to be an actual change in visual functioning. Great body experience. Occasionally, the physio kundalini process is accompanied by the sensation of being larger than the physical body. Perhaps this phenomenon is an intensified version of the state of joy that is described as feeling 10 feet tall. Here, the kinesthetic sense seems to extend beyond the normally experienced boundaries of the body. The person feels as if his or her bodily being has ballooned out. Non-physiological phenomena. Out-of-body experiences. Out-of-body experiences involve the subjective feeling of living the physical body either as a formless conscious identity or in the form of a supra-physical counterpart, etheric double or astral body. This phenomenon has come to the attention of the medical establishment through the large number of patients who have reported having had this experience during anesthesia or while being otherwise unconscious. Medicine treats out-of-body experiences as hallucination or delusions. Attempts have been made, however, by parapsychologists to establish the objective nature of these experiences. There is some evidence that OBEs can be at least partially objective. This calls in question the current Western model of the relationship between brain and consciousness. As in single seeing, the language used to describe OBEs is so typical that we may think of these experiences as distinct from other states of divided consciousness. There are many anecdotal accounts of this experience. An interesting one is given by Joyce McIver. She has had numerous OBEs, all triggered by her Sufi practice of relaxation and meditation. Of special interest is her following observation. Soon, usually in a matter of 5 to 10 minutes, I would see the great banks of clouds sweep down and separate, roll back and then sweep down again in different formations and colors and separate again, always leaving the path at the center. Simultaneously, a feeling of warmth and movement would start up from the bottom of my spinal column, rising, growing warmer as it moved up, on up toward my shoulder blades, accompanied by flashes of heat coming up over my skin, until arms, legs, hands and back, and lately abdomen sometimes felt uncomfortably warm. The pusher, as I call this spinal crawler, seemed to meet with some block before it could get into my neck. No matter, each time I did the exercise, it seemed to strike out harder and harder, and lately, towards the end of the sixth week, I noticed flashes of light, seemingly in the room and near my body, beyond the private theater, appearing in my closed eyelids. As I wrote in an appendix to Joyce McIver's book, it is very clear to me that her journeys into the hidden levels of reality had a positive, healing and revelatory effect on her life. This conclusion is frequently countered with the argument that such experiences are only possible if you believe in them. To this argument I answer yes, such experiences are only possible if you believe in them and may in fact be created by that belief. This answer does not diminish the value of the experience, instead it leaves open and unrestricted our definition of human potential and provides unrestricted horizons for the depth and scope of spiritual growth. For through the data on the OBE phenomenon, the works by Robert Monroe, Sylvan Muldoon and Robert Crookhall can be recommended. Psychic Perceptions Psychic abilities and experiences, notably the ability to obtain information through means other than the known physical senses, are frequently reported by people in whom the Kundalini process is active. Such paranormal experiences, if confirmed, would have to be listed under the sensory category and, like OBEs, would require explanations that go beyond today neurophysiological models. In some cases, these psychic perceptions are clearly the result of an awaked kundalini. Often, however, they perceive the awakening. This may indicate that the physio-kundalini cycle is more readily triggered in people who are naturally more sensitive and psychic.
Correlations with Bento's model. Motor signs and symptoms. The cerebral current may stimulate the motor cortex or thalamic centers associated with group muscle movements, such as the posturing reflexes. The apparent non-specificity of some of these movements may indicate that the focus of disturbance is deep in the brain rather than in the cortex. Breathing patterns may be similarly stimulated and paralysis is probably a secondary effect, as already noted. Body sensations. These may be attributed to direct stimulation of the sensory cortex by the current generated in the cerebral hemispheres. The characteristic sequence of affected body parts corresponds to their sequence of representation in the sensory cortex. First the toes, then the limbs, back, head, eyes and face, to the throat and finally the abdominal area represented just above the temporal lobe. According to Bentov's model, the earliest body sensations in the Kundalini process appear in the foot, especially the left big toe represented in the brain central sulcus. The Holy River Ganges is said to have originated from the large toe of God. In Siddha Yoga, the teacher's feet are special objects of veneration, particularly the large toe. The exact correspondence between the sequence of stimulation in the typical physio Kundalini cycle and the sequence of representation in the sensory cortex gives strong support to at least this aspect of Bentov's model. It's interesting to note that in this model the throat and abdomen are the last sites to open, indicating the completion of the cycle. The importance of the throat is traditionally recognized in one of the esoteric names given to Kundalini, namely Vag Ishvari or Goddess of Speech. Supposedly, it is after the throat opening that the legendary magical powers of an adept are greatly magnified. Heat and cold sensations. These may be caused by the hypothalamic stimulation. The representation of the body in this area of the brain is less specific than it is in the cortex, which may explain the lack of regularity in the movement of these particular sensations. Objective manifestations of extreme heat are difficult to explain with Bentov's model alone. It does not contradict them but suggests that other factors are also involved in the Kundalini phenomenon. Light and sound phenomena. This could be due to stimulation near the lateral and medial geniculates regions, as well as to standing waves generated in the ventricles. The usual lack of formed elements could be due to the large distance of the circuit from cortical representation for light and sound. Foreign visions and voices may indicate a spreading of the stimulation to adjacent associative areas for speech, sound and vision. If they were psychically determined, they would have quite a different and unknown origin. Certainly objective manifestations of light, if confirmed, would also require explanations beyond our present knowledge. Pain. Pain might occur when the current generated in the brain meets with some resistance that is not easily overcome. The perception of the pain may be referred out and may seem to come from various parts of the body, or motor stimulation could cause tension generating pain in the periphery itself. In practice, it makes little difference whether these impurities or blocks to the rise of the Kundalini current are actually located in the chakras of the spinal axis, as the yogins claim, or in peripheral body parts, or in specific brain regions, or at some more subtle level of the mind. These different possibilities are not mutually exclusive and the net result in the same. Emotions and distorted thought processes. These are not inconsistent with Bentov's model, but are too complex to be explained by it at this time. Detachment and dissociation. Wilder Penfield, 1958, reported experiences akin to detachment and dissociation upon direct stimulation of area 39 of the cortex. Thus, they could be a simple result of the circulating current or they could have a more subtle psychological origin. Single seeing and the great body. These experiences are not inconsistent with Bentov's model but cannot be explained by it thus far. Out-of-body and psychic experiences, 
Bentov's model does not offer an explanation for these phenomena, which have been objectively confirmed, though it does give guidelines for the direction in which research might profitably move. I will say more about this at the end of the next chapter. Kundalini, classical and clinical. As I have already explained, there are two major models of Kundalini activity. On the one hand, there is the classical model formulated in the yoga and tantra scriptures of India. On the other hand, there is Bentov's physiological model together with the kind of clinical observation presented in this book. Those aspects of the process that could have a purely physiological basis I have designated as physio kundalini and the majority of my clinical observations fall within this category. These physio kundalini signs and symptoms differ in important respects from the descriptions found in the yogic literature. The most notable difference concerns the pathway taken by the kundalini energy in its ascent and the bodily sensations associated with this. According to the classical model, the kundalini awakens or is awaked at the base of the spine, travels straight up the central axis of the body and completes its journey when it reaches the crown of the head. Along this route, there are said to be several centers of psychic energy. These centers or chakras contain impurities that must be removed before the kundalini energy can continue its upward course. By contrast, the clinical picture is that the kundalini energy travels up the legs and the back to the top of the head, then down the face, through the throat, to a terminal point in the abdominal area. What is the relationship between these two descriptions? First of all, we must appreciate that the yogic accounts, in addition to being dogmatic, are often very subtle. Western scientists argue that the actual location of sensory perception is in the sensory cortex, even though the sensations are felt to be in the periphery. Similarly, the yogins might mean that the sensations, blocks and openings, such as the throat opening, which are felt to occur in various body parts, are in some subtle way represented in the spinal chakras. Another point of difference between the classical and the clinical descriptions is the time factor. All the characteristic features of the physio kundalini complex are included in the classical descriptions. And yet we find quite ordinary people who complete the physio kundalini cycle in a matter of months, whereas the yogic scriptures assign a much longer period, generally several years, to the complete kundalini process in the case of the most advanced initiates. Here we have the suggestion that the full kundalini awakening is a more comprehensive process of which the physio kundalini cycle is only a part. It is quite feasible that the physio kundalini is a separate mechanism that may be activated as part of a complete kundalini awakening. It is too early to draw any final conclusions. Much of the problem stems from the difficulty of comparing different stages whereas in fact many of the processes occur concurrently. Individual differences further complicate the picture. However, it is possible to bring some clarity into this matter by regarding the Kundalini awakening as a purificatory process. If the impurities or imbalances have any objective reality, it should be possible to demonstrate their existence by physiological and psychological tests and to correlate their removal with specific signs and symptoms observed clinically. Since Bentov's model explains how this process may be triggered, and since we know how it may be recognized in its initial stages, long-term case studies covering the entire course of the Kundalini unfolding are a logical step in these investigations. They would be invaluable in documenting specific objective ways in which the Kundalini process is beneficial. Bentov's model can account in detail for many of the signs and symptoms observed in the course of a Kundalini awakening. Even if it ultimately proves to be only partially correct or to explain only a part of the total Kundalini phenomenon, it is of enormous heuristic value at this point. What distinguishes Bentov's model from all previous attempts to explain the Kundalini is that it generates further hypotheses and even suggests a number of experiments to test them. Here are some ideas. 1. 
Measure the very weak magnetic fields around the head of an expert meditator, following methods such as those described by Brenner, Williamson and Kaufman. 2. Determine at what stage of meditation the irregular micro-tremor changes to a resonant vibration. 3. Develop a biofeedback system to aid meditators in reaching resonance. 4. Study the effects of magnetic stimulation on one side and then on both sides of the head. 5. Study light, heat and sound sensations reported by meditators and determine which of these can be correlated with physically measurable conditions. Chapter 9. The Kundalini Cycle. Diagnosis and Therapy. Diagnostic considerations. The clinical data at hand indicates a clear distinction between the physio-kundalini complex and psychosis. These findings also furnish a number of criteria for distinguishing between these two conditions. In some of the cases presented in this book, we have seen that a schizophrenia-like condition can result when the person undergoing the kundalini experience receives negative feedback either through social pressure or through the resistances created by earlier conditioning. Evidence that these conditions are distinct and separate is supplied particularly by two of my cases. The first is the case of the female artist, which I outlined in chapter 6. The other case is not included in this book. It involved a person who became psychotic after being confined to a mental institution for inappropriate behavior. Each of them reported that during their stay in their respective mental institutions, they were quite sure that they and several of the other patients could tell who among them were crazy and who were just far out and turned on. Possibly this is a situation where it takes one to know one, and the person whose own kundalini is active can intuitively sense the kundalini state of another. This is of special interest, as such people could be consulted when assistance is needed to decide which way the balance lies between the two processes in any particular case. Clinicians usually have a finely tuned sense of what is psychotic. For the most part, it is this sense for the smell of psychosis that tells us if a patient is unbalanced or whether he or she is instead inundated with more positive psychic forces. Also, trained clinicians generally have a feeling for whether a patient is dangerous to himself or herself and to others. Individuals who experience hostility or anger in the early phases of Kundalini awakening are, in my experience, rarely inclined to dramatize their violent emotions. Furthermore, those in whom the Kundalini elements predominate are usually much more objective about themselves and have an interest in sharing their experiences and troubles. Those on the psychotic side tend to be very oblique, secretive and totally preoccupied with ruminations about some vague but apparently significant subjective aspect of their experiences that they can never quite communicate. My clinical data together with Bentov's model allows me to highlight several more distinguishing features. Sensations of heat are common in Kundalini states, but are rare in psychosis. Also very typical are feelings of vibration or fluttering, tingling and itching that move in definite patterns over the body, usually in the sequence described earlier. But these patterns may be regular in atypical cases or in those who have preconceived ideas of how the Kundalini energy should circulate. In addition to this, bright lights may be seen internally. There may be pain, especially in the head, which arises suddenly and ceases equally suddenly during critical phases in the process. Unusual breathing patterns are common, as well as other spontaneous movements of the body. Noises such as chirping and whistling sounds are heard, but seldom do voices intrude in a negative way, as is the case in psychotic states. When voices are heard, they are perceived to come from within and are not mistaken for outer realities. 
My clinical findings support the view that the Kundalini force is positive and creative. Each of my Kundalini clients is now successful in his or her own terms. They all report that they can handle stress more easily and have become more relational. The classical cases indicate that special capacities, known as cities or powers, as well as deep inner peace, may result from the completion of the Kundalini process. But in the initial stages, stress induced by the experience itself, coupled with a negative attitude from oneself or others, may be overwhelming and cause severe imbalance. Experience suggests that such cases are best approached with understanding, strength and gentle support. Earlier I described the case of the writer whose spontaneous trances had disturbed him greatly. They seethed altogether when I encouraged him to enter a trance state voluntarily. By making a distinction between psychotic and psychically active, I had communicated to him the attitude that his trances were valid and meaningful. Because of my own acceptance of his experience, he was also able to accept it. The trances ceased to control him as soon as he gave up his resistance to them and their underlying forces. Similarly, the female psychologist suffered from severe headaches, which stop as soon as she ceased trying to control the process, accepting it instead. The pain, in other words, did not result from the Kundalini process itself, but from the person's resistance to it. I suspect this is true of all the negative effects of the physio-kundalini mechanism. Symptoms caused by the physio-kundalini will disappear spontaneously over time. Because we are dealing essentially with a purificatory or balancing process, and since each person represents a finite system, the process is self-limiting. Disturbances must also not be viewed as pathological. They are rather therapeutic inasmuch they lead to a removal of potentially pathological elements. The Kundalini force arises spontaneously from deep within the body-mind and is apparently self-directing. Tension and imbalance thus result not from the process itself, but from conscious and subconscious interference with it. Helping a person to understand and accept what's happening to him or her may be the best we can do. Usually the process, when left alone, will find its own natural pace and balance. However, if it has already become too rapid or violent, my experience suggests that its course can be moderated by vigorous exercise and by suspending meditation. Those in whom the physio-kundalini process is most readily activated and in whom it is most likely to become violent and disturbing are those with especially sensitive nervous systems, the natural psychics. Many of my cases had had some kind of psychic experience prior to their kundalini awakening. Natural psychics tend to find the physio-kundalini experience so intense that they will not engage in the regular classical meditation methods that commonly enhance the kundalini process. Sometimes, if they do not wish to refrain from meditating altogether, they may adopt some mild form of their own choosing. Much of their anxiety may be due to misunderstanding and ignorance of the physio-kundalini process. Rather than increasing their fear, one should obviously give them the knowledge and confidence to allow the process to progress at the maximum comfortable, natural rate. Clearly, much could be accomplished by changing attitudes, first in those experiencing the kundalini phenomenon, but ultimately in our society as a whole. This would benefit all of us who need viable models in our spiritual quests. Unfortunately, in our Western civilization, spiritual values and attitudes are generally suppressed. Some other cultures are more advanced in this regard, and they recognize the positive contribution made by spiritually or psychically developed individuals. Thus, in Bali, the trend state serves an important adaptive function for the children. As Richard Katz has shown, The African Bushmen use trends as a central ritual that promotes social cohesion. I was informed by Jay Scooch that in South Africa, a psychic condition, which Western psychiatry would probably identify as an acute schizophrenic break, is a prerequisite for initiation into the priesthood of one tribe. In the Himalayan countries, trends mediums fulfill an important social function. Many more examples could readily be given. By contrast, 
how many creative people in our culture are suffering because of diagnostic mistakes. I feel that the healing profession has a special obligation to make every effort to correct these mistakes. Recognition of the Kundalini phenomenon as a non-psychotic process is part of this. It is tragic that potentially charismatic folks like shamans, trans mediums and God-intoxicated individuals, similar to the masts of India, might actually find themselves in custodial care in our society. Possibly there are many now who, despite their eccentricities, should be released so that they can enrich our lives. The problem is to identify them among the other inmates of our mental institutions. Here, Mehir's Baba's work with the masts, as mentioned in Appendix 2, might serve as a useful precedent. If it is true, as I have already suggested, that it takes one to know one, such people could indeed be invaluable in our diagnosis and therapeutic support of Kundalini cases. Of those undergoing the Kundalini process without preparation, not a few tend to feel quite insane, at least at times. By behaving normally and keeping silent about their experience, they may avoid being labeled schizophrenic or being hospitalized or sedated. But imagine their sense of isolation and the suffering caused by their separation from others. We must reach these people, their families and the larger culture with the information necessary to help them recognize their condition as a blessing, not a curse. Certainly, we must no longer subject people in the midst of this rebirth process to drugs or shock therapy, approaches which are poles apart from creative self-development and spiritual maturation. Instead, we must begin to acknowledge that these individuals, through they may be confused and fearful, are already undergoing therapy from within, a therapy that is far superior to any that modern medicine could administer from without. Kundalini as therapy. Several of my Kundalini cases are especially interesting because they serve as support for my contention that the Kundalini process can be looked upon as being inherently therapeutic. A psychologist writer was hospitalized for three months 30 years ago. He had been diagnosed as suffering from a psychotic break characterized by disturbances in judgment, flight of ideas, grandiosity and overactivity. After that episode, he was somewhat unstable, suffering from a chronic mild depression. Nevertheless, he made his living as a therapist, occasionally being very effective, but constantly becoming involved in counter-transference problems, that is, over-involvement with his clients. At other times, he was unable to provide for himself adequately. In 1974, he became a disciple of some Swami, a master of Siddha Yoga. He found that his stay at the Swami's Indian Hermitage and the contact with that adept and other spiritual practitioners proved a very potent therapy. Signs of Kundalini awakening began to appear early in his involvement with that Swami and it led to, or at least was accompanied by, a prodigious increase in productivity in his writing. He also began to enjoy new depths in his interpersonal relationships and gained a sure grasp on his life. I saw him frequently both before and during this important period in his life and can attest to the dramatic strengthening of his whole personality structure, character and his ways of dealing with the world, both inner and outer. Another case, a female psychologist, now in her mid-50s, had been severely depressed for many years and had even made two serious suicide attempts by overdosing on sleeping pills. She remained in a coma for several days following each episode. Her only extended hospitalization occurred prior to these suicide attempts as a result of her depression following the birth of her first child. For years, she held a responsible position as an administrator and she was also a successful psychotherapist. During this time, she herself was undergoing psychotherapy, including a classical psychoanalysis. In 1972, this woman attended a meditation retreat during which she spent many hours each day in meditation. Within a short time, she began to have spontaneous Kundalini experiences. I got to know her in 1973. During the first year of our acquaintance, she was somewhat withdrawn and reserved. But later, she blossomed into a secure, intact, fun-loving person. 
She tells me that she has not known a day of depression since. My observations confirm her self-appraisal. I recall four psychics, each of whom had been diagnosed as suffering from some sort of convulsing disorder. In each case, there was a marked relief in symptoms and in their need for anti-convulsing medication after finding and using their psychic talents. Some other creative pursuit might have proven equally liberating. These four people chose to become professional psychics and although no claim is made based on this evidence for a causal relationship between their new energy, investment and the amelioration of their symptoms, it is suggestive. I feel quite certain that at a higher level of functioning, such as may become effective through the Kundalini process, they will accrue all kinds of benefits, including better health and emotional balance. Of course, as we have seen, the Kundalini process can also be disruptive. If left alone, a person may well suffer doubts and fears that could easily be handled in a supportive environment like a spiritual hermitage or monastery, where the disturbing side effects of a Kundalini awakening are rightly understood, accepted, and to some extent even welcomed. Without such a setting, however, those who experience this force may react in a number of undesirable ways. Naive individuals may interpret the experience as an inner change so profound and upsetting as to be a convincing indication of loss of sanity. This is essentially what happened in the case of the female artist and that of the actress described in chapter 6. Also, in at least one instance, that of the middle-aged housewife, the confusion and turmoil arising from a spontaneous kundalini awakening led to psychic inflation and delusions of grandeur. The female psychologist handled her inner disruption by becoming a member of various groups and by funding supportive teachers and therapists. It was necessary for her to make use of these aids for a year or more before she could continue on her own. The scientist, whose understanding was even more adequate and whose situation was quite supportive, was able to function by simply cutting down on the intensity of his meditations. It should be clear by now that physicians are well advised to be alert for the symptoms patterns of an active Kundalini when making a diagnosis. Neurologists with diagnostic problems mimicking pathological conditions may gain valuable diagnosis clues by reviewing the patient's meditation history. In this way, they may delay or completely avoid harsh and inappropriate diagnostic procedures. Psychotherapists dealing with hysterical overlays or psychotic reactions to Kundalini awakening are reminded that beneath the neurosis or psychosis, a process is occurring that is far beyond our ordinary understanding of psychopathology and of the kind of ecstatic states described, for instance, by William James. In addition to psychotherapy, if indicated, I recommend that persons suspected of Kundalini problems be urged to consult someone with experience in this area. Of course, selecting a helping person may be most difficult. Unless the physician is experienced and has explored the available resources, he or she may be unable to do more than recommend that the patient seek out such an individual. In some cases, it may be appropriate to refer the patient to a spiritual teacher who is known to be familiar with the Kundalini phenomenon and may even, as was the case with the late Swami, be able to induce it by way of psychic transmission. I must, however, sound a word of caution here. I firmly believe that methods designed specifically to hasten kundalini arousal, such as the breath control exercises known as pranayama, are hazardous unless practiced directly under the guidance of a competent spiritual teacher or guru who should have gone through the whole kundalini process himself or herself. Deliberate practice of yogic breathing techniques may prematurely unleash titanic inner forces for which the unprepared individual has no means of channeling and control. The Kundalini can be forced, but only to one's own detriment. Epilogue In scientific circles, it is something of a truism that many experiments with surprising and unexplained outcomes remain unpublished, whereas those that support favorite hypotheses get into print. In other words, the business of science is not as objective as scientific ideology would have it. This explains why the more esteemed scientific journals, which of course are also the most conservative, have given very little space to the kind of unusual phenomena that are mentioned in this book. 
However, there are many stalwart researchers who are not discouraged by this, but who continue to dedicate their lives to exploring psycho-spiritual realities. One of these maverick scientists is Hiroshi Motoyama. He has done much to verify the chakra system and also the acupuncture meridians through his sophisticated electromagnetic equipment. It was at his laboratory in Tokyo, Japan, that Itzhak Bentov and I did a series of experiments that showed amplitude differences in the body's micromotions on the right and left sides of the head. The motion on the left was 50% greater. Shortly after we had noted this remarkable difference, we chanced upon another significant discovery. When our subject went into a deep meditative state, this right-left difference was almost equalized. In ordinary consciousness, the EEG amplitude at one side of the brain is greater than the other. With feedback and patience, a person can balance this difference, and at that point he or she feels profound peace and tranquility. Perhaps our finding is a physical counterpart of the psychological state. Jay Millet observed that subjective reports of peacefulness, centeredness, and light were common among a group of students who achieved 7 to 13 hertz EEG phase coherence between the right and the left cerebral hemisphere. Another confirmation of the link between mental states and physiology is seen in the work of Manfred Kleins. He has shown that an emotion can be recorded by a symbol transducer sensitive to lateral and vertical pressure. Kleins had his subjects fantasize a particular emotion and press on the transducer simultaneously. This created a characteristic signature or waveform for each emotion. Sylvia Brody and Saul Axelrod noted that fetal responses studied by them had pattern, direction and effect. Later, William Condon and Louis Sander found that the apparent random movements of infants were synchronized with adult speech they heard. Summarizing the work of these two scientists, Joseph Chilton Peirce stated that as adults we have our own personal repertoire of micromuscular movements coordinating with our use of and reception to speech. These studies, similar to those I mentioned earlier, are further evidence for a sensory motor link. My colleagues and I, as well as others, have attempted to measure physiological correlates of meditators reported sensations of heat, light, and sound. As noted in the case histories of meditators undergoing the Kundalini awakening, we did observe temperature changes in one case. Such changes could be made visible on recently developed medical thermographic equipment without the need for attaching temperature transducers to the bodies of meditating subjects. Other investigators, particularly R. Dobrin, have described the use of sensitive photomultiplier tubes to detect low-intensity ultraviolet light from the bodies of experimental subjects, but so far little attention has been paid to correlating such measurements with meditative processes. Our attempts to measure physiological correlates of meditators' sound sensations were unsuccessful. Further work along all these lines using improved equipment and experimental procedures is called for. It will help demonstrate the extent to which there is an objective basis for the subjective reports of meditators. We did an interesting experiment, which has not, to my knowledge, been confirmed or replicated, using Hiroshi Motoyama's electric field sensor or chakra measuring device. When the subject sat quietly in this machine, we could observe the usual EEG waveform. After a few minutes of deep meditation, probably at the point where the subject felt he or she had transcended the ordinary consciousness, there suddenly appeared a diminution of these signals and a corresponding increase in amplitude in a higher frequency band, one which our experimenters had not been equipped to detect. To our surprise, this new waveform was in the frequency range of 350 to 500 Hz, much higher than the 0 to 50 Hz frequency range of a normal EEG waveform. These higher frequency EEG signals could be an easily measured physiological indicator of certain meditative states and out-of-body experiences, or of bilocation of consciousness. If so, a subject full of mystery and fascination for centuries can now become a new frontier for science.
Chapter 10. The Kundalini and Spiritual Life Kundalini awakenings can and do happen, as I have shown, even without any spiritual preparation or meditation practice. This raises the question of the role of the Kundalini in the spiritual process. According to some schools of thought, spiritual life is dependent on the Kundalini power. These schools insist that the latent energy of the body-mind must be galvanized into activity and raised along the bodily axis to the crown of the head before a real spiritual transformation can occur. If this were true, however, we would have to discount many spiritual traditions. There have been and still are genuine mystics who have never consciously experienced the psychophysical symptoms associated with the Kundalini arousal. They may know nothing of headaches, burning sensations, painful currents of energy shooting from the feet or the base of the spine up into the head, or of the seven or more wheels of energy in the body. And yet they may experience the unity of consciousness, tranquility and bliss. They may even be psychic. If we assume with Gopi Krishna that the Kundalini is a fundamental evolutionary mechanism underlying all psychic and spiritual phenomena, then there are two explanations for the absence of physio-kundalini symptoms in many spiritual practitioners and accomplished mystics. The first explanation is that these individuals are relatively free of the kind of obstructions or psychophysical resistances that tend to complicate the kundalini process in others. The second is that their psycho-spiritual realizations are the result of only a partial awakening of the kundalini power. Both explanations have their supporters, and my personal opinion is that without additional research, the matter cannot be conclusively settled. What we can consider further, however, is the relationship between the Kundalini and authentic spirituality. Granted that the Kundalini fulfills an evolutionary function in the body-mind, does this mechanism really have anything to do with the spiritual process? It depends on what we mean by spiritual. Here we must note that spirituality is generally understood to consist in attitudes and techniques leading to psychic experiences or powers and extraordinary and large states of consciousness. This would clearly make spirituality a matter of the evolving nervous system. Some people indeed make this claim. A different, more radical point of view is put forward by the adept Dalavananda. His point of view is perfectly consistent with the great non-dualist traditions of the world, such as Advaita Vedanta and Mahayana Buddhism. His argument is, very simply, that most so-called spiritual accomplishments are experiences generated within the body-mind and are therefore not truly self-transcending. They are products of the great search for fulfillment or happiness. Authentic spirituality, by contrast, is founding in the moment-to-moment -moment transcendence of the ego, the body-mind, and all possible experiential states. It has nothing to do with the search for God or higher evolutionary possibilities. It requires living on the basis of the intuitive recognition that there is no real separation from life or God or the transcendental reality. Dalovananda puts it thus. Our obligation is not to invert and go elsewhere to God nor to extrovert and exploit ourselves in the self-possessed or anti-ecstatic mood that presumes God to be absent or non-existent. Our obligation is to awaken beyond ourselves, beyond the phenomena of body and mind, into that in which body and mind inhere. Such awakening or self-transcendence is possible only when we begin to understand that the egoic body-mind is by tendency recoiling from everything or, as Dalov Ananda would say, is always avoiding relationship, in his own words. You have been contracted upon yourself with emotional force and no amount of thinking, considering, experiencing, desiring, exploiting and manipulating yourself in the world can affect that contraction. No awakening of the Kundalini touches it. It has nothing to do with the Kundalini. You can have Kundalini experiences until you are yawning with boredom, yet you will not have touched this emotional recoil at all. Spiritual practice is primarily a matter of dealing with this automatic gesture of emotional withdrawal from the larger life or, if you will, God. It is this continuous gesture that is the ego, and it is the ego habit that prevents God-realization or enlightenment in the moment. 
Therefore, spiritual practice consists of constantly going beyond the wall of the ego in reaching out and embracing all life fearlessly with an open heart. There must be complete clarity and integrity in one's feelings. Most people are collapsed at the heart. They are in doubt of God, others and themselves. Their feeling being is stunted. In their unhappiness, they search endlessly for ways to feel better. If they cannot console themselves with the usual pleasures of sex, food or power, they look for other means by which to stimulate their nervous systems. They become spiritual seekers, exploring the potential of their own bodies and minds. And yet, their escape from the basic feeling of dissociation and contraction is destined to be futile. One cannot transcend what one does not recognize and understand. No amount of mystical fireworks in the synapses of the brain can help overcome the crunch at the heart. Once the vision or experience of bliss is over, the person simply returns to his or her state of emotional distress. Then he or she will have to make renewed efforts to stimulate the nervous system or force the Kundalini into higher centers in order to feel blissful again. In this respect, psychic or mystical experiences are little different from orgasms. Whether a person stimulates the sexual organs or the brain, the result is always only a psychophysical experience, not God-realization. In an unpublished talk dated July 8, 1978, Dalov Ananda remarked, The lust for the Kundalini in the brain core is exactly the same as the lust for the Kundalini in the sex center. It is using that mechanism in a different direction. But neither direction is towards God. Attachment to the brain through the inversion of attention in the Kundalini or the life current is traditionally promoted as a way to God. This is an error that has crept into the spiritual traditions. The way to God is not via the Kundalini. The awakening of the Kundalini and becoming absorbed in the brain core is not God-realization. It has nothing to do with God-realization. It's simply a way of tuning into an extraordinary evolutionary mechanism. The way to God-realization is the one by which that mechanism is understood and transcended completely. Authentic spirituality is thus down to earth. It begins and continues by taking responsibility for one's emotional recoil, one's lovelessness, distrust, mood of betrayal, sense of conflict and fear. This is what Dalov Ananda means by the way of the heart. The heart is the key to the practice of real or spiritual life. People tend to focus on the dimensions of the mind or the body and to lose the focus of the heart. Nevertheless, the principle of spirituality is at the heart and the fire of the spiritual process is awakened there. That fire is not situated at the perineum, nor is it up the crown. It is at the heart, at the place of infinity, the root of the being, the feeling core of the body mind. When speaking of the fire of the spiritual process, Dalavananda is of course not pointing to any heat sensations which belong to the realm of the Physio Kundalini. He uses the word metaphorically. A spiritual fire is the subjective sense of catharsis, of being gradually purified of all presumptions, opinions, illusions and delusions as well as all attachments and preferences. That is to say, every single movement within our own consciousness by which we denied or hide from reality. This purification, which is accomplished by staying in place rather than by going on any quest, whether internal or external, can be accompanied by all kinds of mental and physical symptoms, from discomfort to sickness, including fevers and manifestations of heat in different parts of the body. Dalov Ananda speaks from his own experience. He's thoroughly familiar with a wide range of Kundalini symptoms and knows and insists on the difference between kundalini states, mystical experiences, psychic phenomena, and the great spiritual awakening, which has nothing to do with the nervous system. He knows the difference between the kundalini power and the transcendental power, or shakti, which is the infinite and limitless dynamic aspect of the ultimate reality itself. Availing himself of Hindu metaphysics, he speaks of that ultimate reality as Shiva Shakti. Shiva represents the consciousness aspect, whereas Shakti represents the power aspect. But the two are only distinguishable on the conceptual level. In truth, they are the same single intensity. 
Dalavananda remarked, All that arises is already the union of Shiva and Shakti. It is not necessary to raise the Kundalini one inch. It's already raised. It's continually rising. And it is continually descending. It's a circle of conductivity about the sun, the heart. When manifest existence is lived from the point of view of the heart, all ascent and all descent is already and continually accomplished. From this perspective, the Kundalini energy is simply a manifestation of that same single intensity or reality. It is a phenomenon of the evolving human body-mind before it's fully awakened. The enlightened teacher communicates Shiva Shakti or consciousness power by his or her mere existence. He or she is in fact not different from that reality because she or he no longer suffers from the presumption of being a finite being with a body and mind that is ultimately separate from other beings. An enlightened person lives as and out of the fullness of the single reality. Therefore, his or her sheer presence has transformative power, which is of advantage to those who can attune themselves to it. As Dala Vananda explained, the Shakti of the true Guru is not simply or exclusively the Kundalini Shakti, which is always returning to truth, seeking the truth, seeking the union that is truth. The Shakti that flows through the Guru is already the truth. It is the force of truth. The teacher's communication of that which is real has a purifying effect on the disciple who receives this spiritual transmission. And that is its whole purpose. The teacher's transmission can have very different effects in the disciple. It can lead to utterly blissful states or violent emotional reactivity, feelings of well-being or episodes of illness. Regardless of the effects, the primary function of spiritual transmission is to intensify the disciple's whole life. For it is through such intensification that he or she becomes sensitive to and intelligent about the gesture of recoil or self-contraction. Only then there can be real change or transformation. And one indication of real change is the willingness to transcend even the most blissful experience until there is the firm realization that there is only the one unqualified reality. That all this is not mere philosophy is clear from Dalavananda's numerous writings and the accounts of his disciples. He speaks with authority from personal realization. In his spiritual autobiography, The Knee of Listening, he describes how until his second or third year, his sense of identity was that of being a bubble of energy, light, and flawless joy, which he calls deep bright. Upon the loss of this extraordinary condition, he set out on a quest that was to last until 1970. As a child, he would periodically pass into what appeared to be feverish deliriums during which he reawakened to the condition of the bright. Although the bright had preceded, it was still effective in him as a mysterious impulse. It was, however, during his years at Columbia University that he began to systematically explore the possibility of the human body-mind ever in search of the bright. One night, feelings he had exhausted his search, he had the following experience. Then, quite suddenly, in a moment, I experienced a total revolution of energy and awareness in myself. An absolute sense of understanding opened and arose at the extreme end of all this consciousness. And all of the energy of thought that moved down into that depth appeared to reverse its direction at some unfathomable point. The rising impulse caused me to stand and I felt a surge of force drop out of my depth and expand, filling my whole body and every level of my consciousness with wave on wave of the most beautiful and joyous energy. My head had begun to ache with the intense energy that saturated my brain. And at last I wore myself out wandering in the streets so that I returned to my room. By the time he arrived at Stanford University in 1961, he had become certain that the enlightened state was prevented by a simple mechanism in his own consciousness. He now set out to rigorously observe its activity. He borrowed the Greek mythological figure of Narcissus to symbolize that mechanism of loveless self-encapsulation, the ego habit. 
He had many remarkable psychic and mystical experiences during that time. One experience is of particular interest here. During a formal LSD session at the Veterans Administration Hospital in Mountain View, California, he was overwhelmed by a profound emotion, beginning at the base of the spine and traveling up to the heart, the throat, back of the head, and culminating at the crown of the head. He wrote about this experience as follows. I had become conscious of the formal structure of our living being, analogous to the nervous system, but even more than that, what is called in Indian and occult literature the chakra body or the awakened kundalini shakti. It was this very form, this ordinary and spiritual body, which I knew as a child and recognized as the bright. He would also frequently experience the spherical form of the so-called astral body, as well as a sensation of thumbs pressing in on him. Although these experiences held a certain fascination for him, his primary motivation was to understand the mechanism of the self-contraction. He then realized that he was in need of a teacher. In 1964, he entered a discipleship under Albert Rudolf, known as Rudy, or Swami Rudrananda. He taught a type of kundalini yoga that was based on self-effort rather than self-transcendence and grace. With Rudy, Dalavananda had his first experiences of the transmission of psychic energy from teacher to disciple. Finding that Rudy's yoga contradicted his own intuition that the spiritual process is founded in self-surrender rather than in any effortful self-discipline, Dalavananda turned to another Swami. After only three days at this hermitage in India, Dalavananda experienced a state of unqualified ecstasy known as Nirvikalpa Samadhi. He returned to India the following year and during his second stay, he experienced a whole range of kundalini and visionary experiences, including the vision of the blue pearl that figures prominently in the teaching of the late Swami. All this was confirmed in the letter a rare gesture of the Swami that stated that Dalavananda had attained yogic liberation and was not qualified to teach others. But Dalavananda knew that his spiritual journey had not yet come to an end, nor had he any particular interest in teaching Kundalini Yoga. He felt certain that even the state of unqualified ecstasy he had repeatedly experienced, never mind any of the other visions and psychic phenomena, was dependent on the manipulation of the nervous system. Therefore, it could not possibly be the same as enlightenment or God-realization, which is continuous. So he intensified his practice of self-observation and surrender. Then on September 10, 1970, the following occurred. In an instant, I became profoundly and directly aware of what I am. It was a tacit realization, a direct knowledge in consciousness itself. It was consciousness itself without the addition of a communication from any other source. There was no thought involved in this. I am that consciousness. There was no reaction either of joy or surprise. I am the one I recognize. I am that one. Then truly there was no more to realize. Every experience in my life had led to this. Subsequent to this awakening, Dalavananda experienced a blossoming of spontaneous psychic activity, which continues to this day. It demonstrates his point that enlightenment is not the goal, but the foundation of spiritual transformation. Thank you very much for listening to this audiobook until the end. Please let me know in the comments why you were interested in this topic or if you've been experimenting any of the things that were stated in this book. Is there anything particular that strikes your attention? And if you wish to support the channel, please like this video and share it to a friend. You may also subscribe if you wish to receive other audiobooks. In the meanwhile, take good care of yourself and of all living beings. This is the way of yoga.